believe we have a quorum now. Um, so I can call the meeting to order. Um, this is the Sherborne Advisory Committee uh, public meeting on Wednesday, March 10th. Um, first order of business, uh, can any of the advisory members uh, volunteer to take minutes? I got it. Steve. I can. Covers here. Oh, oh, Mark, Mark, Mark had dibs. Thank you, Mark. Um, all right. So first off, um, we're going to do the uh, reading of the agenda. So open meeting and roll call. Um, currently, let's see. We have myself, Steve Tsai, Natalie Weir, uh, Mark Albers, Drew Kashal, uh, and Wasim Basili. Um, again, I should expect a few more advisory members to roll in um, in these first few minutes. Um, we have uh, addition of topics not reasonably anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Um, I do not have any items. Um, does anybody else from advisory have any items to, to add? No. All right, hearing none. Uh, we then will have uh, our liaison reports as needed. Um, and then current meeting items, we are uh, we are see, hearing uh, annual town meeting warrant article presentations. Um, tonight we will be hearing from uh, Dave Goldberg regarding the turf field at Laurel Farm. Uh, Wendy Alassie has two revaluation certification and uh, change in the assessor law. And we have two citizen petitions. Uh, first from Jeanette Slickenmeyer for a ban of new fur products. Uh, and then from uh, Larissa Romanova regarding banning the sale of dogs, cats, and rabbits. Um, then we have the Sean Colleen hour. Uh, hopefully it's only an hour. Uh, first, facilities replacement reserve fund, then DPW equipment, then the one ton truck, uh, roadway management, Pine Hill access road, and uh, Leland slash Woodhaven water supply. Um, after that, we will approve previous meeting minutes, um, and then that will be the end. Uh, does anybody from advisory have any questions or comments regarding the agenda? No. None. All right, excellent. Um, so ben, I guess we'll, yeah. Karen, I just, I just have an announcement to make. Um, I'm, I'm sure you all know this, that effective April 2nd, um, I'm gonna be retiring from the town of Sherburn as the finance director. And I wanted to let everyone know that um, Deb Seifring, our assistant town accountant, will be assuming my responsibilities effective immediately as I transition uh, towards my retirement. Uh, Deb has been the assistant town accountant um, for 14 years. Um, as the assistant, she has all the signing authority of the finance director in my absence. So the transition will be very smooth. Um, Deb will be attending advisory, select board, finance meetings, and she will also be representing you all at the um, advisory hearing on April 10th and the annual town meeting on April 14th. Um, she will also be our, our new liaison to the DOR and our external auditors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, going forward, I just want you all to make sure that um, all financial inquiries and, and correspondence um, that used to go through the finance director are now going through Deb immediately. Uh, and I just want you all to know that you are definitely in excellent hands. Uh, her 14 years of uh, increasing experience as the town um, accountant um, has been amazing. Um, she has a really excellent background um, prior to that in auditing. She's, uh, as many of you know, she's very detail oriented, very experienced. Um, in the wonderful world of municipal finance and understanding all the laws that govern um, the finance arena. So um, I just want you to join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are sorry to see you go, Sharon, um, but I am glad that um, there is a smooth transition plan in place. And Deb, I look very much look forward to working with you. Well, thank you very much. Sharon's been a wonderful, uh, influence and a role model so I, I we work well together and hopefully the transition will go very smoothly great um all right are there any other liaison reports from advisory all 
All right, then hearing none, I think we will uh, launch into our warrant presentations. And so our first um, uh, article is going to be from the um, Recreation Committee. Um, I see Dave Goldberg and Gavin Misher here. Um, I assume uh, Dave, will, you, you presented last time to us, right? So you, you'll probably present. Yeah. Um, well. So uh, again, this is gonna be uh, for uh, replacing or installing a uh, turf field at Laurel Farm. Um, so take it away, Dave. I don't know if you, uh, did you wanna screen share? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share in a minute. Um, so I guess first, I, 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 th I don't think I did this last time, but I'll, but I'll introduce the rec members that are on. So Gavin Mish and Bo O'Connell serve on the, the recreation committee with me. Um, so they're both committee members. And then Doug McDougall is on, he is our facilities director. Um, so they've all been working hard on this proposal and moving this, uh, this project forward. So a lot of thanks to them in terms of getting us to where we are right now. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you, Steve, is, is you don't have this as a, I sent you an email, but you don't have this as a warrant article, right? It's just a capital request. Uh, correct. Yes. Sorry. Yes. So this is, it's in the capital improvement plan and um, but we are, we're taking these two weeks basically to, to discuss Go capital through. items as well. Yeah, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page with regard to that. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through a presentation that we prepared. It's, it's only about 67 or so slides. So I think we should be able to get through it. Which should be fine. <laughs> it's a lot less than that. Um, it's, it's designed probably to be about five, seven minutes. So high level just kind of hit on the motivation for the project, um, what's in scope for the project, talk a little bit about the financing from a, from a very high level. And then um, I just want to open it up to questions. There's a lot of detail that we have that sits behind the presentation, but I didn't want to go down a path that, you know, wasn't relevant to you guys. So, um, so again, don't think just because I've, I've only hit stuff at a high level, we don't, we don't have more to talk about, but I'm just going to leave it to you guys to kind of direct the the conversation after I get through that, if that works for you guys. Sure. Okay, awesome. So you should see, see my presentation now, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, is it a presentation now? Let's go swap displays. How's that? Yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. So I just wanted to start with why are we doing this? Um, so we've been talking about uh, synthetic field over at Laurel for a, a while now. Um, and the, the motivation for that is to, first of all, provide a better playing experience for the people that use the facilities. Um, so right now, the grass fields at times can be inconsistent in terms of how they play. Um, and also there's, there's limitations in terms of how long we can use or, or the, uh, the amount of hours we can use on those fields at any given time. So early in the spring, like now, where we're waiting for the grass to grow, they're unavailable, um, even if the snow were melted. But also if we have rainfall um, and, certain, and, and, and uh, a lot of use, we have to put those fields to rest to make sure that the grass grows. So um, having a synthetic field gives us uh, a field that we, we can use without having to worry about some of those things. Also part of the scope of the project is to work on the parking over there at Laurel. So anyone who's, spent some time over there knows that, you know, where to park, uh, you know, the flow of traffic is, is confusing at times. So uh, we, we we're trying to address that as part of this project. Um, and one of our driving forces from the very beginning was to make this as, as cost neutral as possible. And I think we've, we've done that. Uh, we don't want to put the burden on the town of Sherburne or the taxpayers. And certainly we don't want to have to pass the cost on to our youth sports organizations by raising their fees. Um, and ultimately, if we're, you know, if we're fortunate, we should have some revenue left over at the end that we can use towards other projects uh, that can benefit people that don't even use these fields, right? So it could be, mean uh, a, a, per, a pickleball court, you know, because we've been asked about a permanent pickleball. It could be improvements to the playground. It could be, it could be used in any, any number of different ways. So so again, if we're able to generate excess revenue from these fields, then it, it helps the rec department in general to put the funds towards, towards other things. So in terms of an overview of the project, um, we are looking at two full-size uh, synthetic fields over at Laurel. Um, I'll, I'll show you where they're located in a second. 
But the idea is that they would be lined and available for uh, a variety of different sports, whether or not it's soccer, lacrosse, field hockey, rugby, doesn't matter. We, we really want them to be utilized as much as possible and, and, and be available for, for just about any sport that wants to use it. Um, we are gonna, well, as, as part of the scope, we're gonna increase the, the parking capacity. So right now we estimate we have about 80 spots over there and that's including if people park along the sides and, and probably in spaces they're not supposed to. So um, given the, the number of kids and, and adults that we have that are at the fields at any given time, we probably need about double what we have right now, um, particularly when you think about you know, crossover times where um, you know, cars are coming in while cars are leaving. Um, so we don't want people waiting around for, for spots in order to, in order to, uh, to facilitate that crossover. Um, as part of that, uh, InScope is, a, is an equipment shed. So uh, not only will the synthetic field uh, need some, some equipment to maintain it, but um, there's an advantage to having some of the uh, DPW uh, equipment down there so it doesn't have to be hauled down there to cut the fields and, and do the, some of the other maintenance. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then uh, as part of this project, we have to take some of the, the natural turf up um, and some of, the, some of the dirt. And that gives us an advantage to, or an opportunity, I should say, to look at some of the natural fields and regrade them and try and, um, try and fix some of, the, some of the pooling problems that we have within the, within the existing fields. So this is uh, a rendering that we worked with Castle Booz on. So they've been hired or contracted, I should say, to work on a master plan with us. You can see the location of the two fields. They will be continuous, so um, you could play. You could put baseball in a corner and and play, you know, across these fields entirely. Um, so there's no there's no seam or anything that prevents you from using the fields in either direction. Um, the maintenance shed is, is in the wrong spot. You can kind of see it here where my where my mouse is. I, we're thinking we're going to move it down to this corner to move it out of the way, but you can see. A, a huge improvement to the parking there at Laurel. Um, so as cars come in, they'll, they'll move it down in one direction. We've got to turn around at the top and they'll be able to come out the other side without, uh, you know, without worrying about you know, the, the flow of traffic there. So the, the, the cost estimate that we've got from Castle Booze is around 4 million for the entire project. Um, our what we're here uh, talking about today is a, is a million dollars um, from the town. And then the balance of whatever it's gonna take to complete the project, we will have to go and raise privately. So the real question is, you know, how do we pay for a million dollar bond, um, you know, and, and ensure that we're not passing the cost of the fields onto the taxpayers of Sherbrooke. So at 2% interest, the, um, the, the amount we'd have to pay every year, assuming we borrow for 10 years, which is about the lifetime of the field. So that's about the length of the, you know, any amount we want to borrow for is about $110,000. So our goal is to ensure that no matter what, we've got enough revenue coming off these fields to first pay back the town. So we've spent a lot of time um, looking over number of available hours, thinking about seasonality, and you know daylight and and so forth and demand within certain um, within certain times to estimate how many hours we think are are available for lease on the on these two fields and again keep in mind this is this doesn't include our grass fields because we still will generate revenue from those fields but if we just look at the synthetic fields that we're talking about we're somewhere around 1200 hours um, and we validated that we've talked to other towns um, that number is, is pretty much in line with what we see other rec departments have fields available for. Likewise, we have a, a blended hourly rate. It's a little bit, I, I won't go into the details, but I have a spreadsheet and I can certainly show you how it breaks down for both in town and out of town. But when you blend the two together, you get about an average hourly rate of, a, of $135 per hour on the field. And again, this is taking into consideration seasonality. So in the summer, when, when the demand is low, the rate goes down. Um, in town is, is, is actually less than what they're paying now for grass fields. So it, it should be a better playing experience actually for less money for any of our youth programs. But generally, like I said, when you, when you blend the, the hourly rates together, you get about $135 an hour. 
and at two fields that gives us um, a projected revenue per year of about 324,000. Now, again, this doesn't really have a heck of a lot of summer use. It doesn't have any winter use. Um, so it's pretty conservative in terms of the total available hours on the field. Likewise, um, we've been fairly conservative about what we believe we're gonna get from out of town uh, clubs. So we've heard as high as $200 an hour per field. Um, we are estimating somewhere between 150 and 175 in terms of what we would charge uh, out of town fields. So, so again, we're, we're trying to be as conservative with these numbers to show that we have plenty of money to, to service the, um, the payments that we would have to uh, pay, pay off the bond with. So just quickly, just so you, again, I mentioned this before, just so you understand there's a lot of uh, data that went behind those numbers. Um, we, we kind of broke out the seasons and we looked at the total, total weekdays, uh, total, total weekend days that we have within the given seasons. Um, we looked at demand both in town and out of town um, on those given days, the number of hours we think we could lease the fields. Um, we looked at seasonal demand. So again, you see here in winter, we don't think we're gonna get a heck of a lot of days that somebody's gonna want that field uh, or those fields, I should say. And then likewise, we had to account for when are the fields gonna be unavailable because of weather conditions. And so we end up with a, with a total number of hours that you can see here which is right around 1200. So it, it, again, it's, it's fairly consistent with what we've seen from other towns. Keep going. Um, again, if we look at across the different towns, we didn't go outside the Metro West, but um, we, we took a sampling of towns in the area to look at what are they charging um, for their synthetic fields. Um, there's a couple of outliers. You can see, you know, Medway is pretty high, Holliston's pretty low, but that 150 to 175, um, seems to be about, about an average across the, across the different towns. So if we, if we take the total number of hours that we saw earlier, the 1280, and you can see here the estimated rates that we think we're gonna get um, in town and out of town. Again, we're trying to keep the cost for the youth programs as low as possible. So, so for them to use the fields at $50 is actually, given the size of these fields is actually less um, per, I don't know, square foot, I suppose, is, is, might be the best way of think, to think of it, than they're paying right now um, on the grass fields. And so here's a breakdown of the seasonal rates and then how we came up to that, that 324 number that you saw earlier. Um, and you know, the one question that from the beginning of this project, we are like, okay, we know that we have the number of available hours, but the real question is if we build it, is there demand out there um, in order to, to take up some of these hours. So we did a, a, a somewhat uh, informal query to a number of clubs in the area. These are four soccer clubs that we talked to. And we said, hypothetically, if we had these failed fields available today, um, how many hours would you want to lease them? And these were the, these were the per year, I should say. And these were the results um, that we got back. There's still tournaments that we could reach out to. There's still lacrosse, there's field hockey. So so even though this is a small number, it doesn't represent really, in terms of total number of clubs, it doesn't represent um, nearly the, the demand I think we would get for, for leasing the, the fields when they're um, not being utilized by our youth teams from, from out of town teams. So I'll, I'll end it here and then I'll, uh, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm hoping to just sort of open it up to questions, but our overall goal was include, improve the gameplay um, for the, you know, the, the, the people that use the fields, both in town and out of town clubs, um, and <laughs> dramatically improve, improve the parking over there at Laurel um, to ensure that the fields themselves were self-funded so that we would be able to pay back the money that we borrowed from the town every year. Um, and we'd have plenty of, plenty of cushion to make sure that we wouldn't run into um, any shortages in, in terms of being able to um, pay back those, uh, the amount that we borrowed. And like I said, the idea, we have lots of ideas in rec um, and not enough money to, to, to sort of see them all through. So any excess revenue that we generated um, would go towards other projects outside of this because we recognize that, you know, not necessarily everyone's going to utilize these fields. But if we think about, you know, we've had requests for bocce courts, um, you know, pickleball, you know, there's, there's 
fitness classes and senior programs that we could help run, um, you know, both in conjunction with the COA and, and on our own. But generally, we believe that, uh, you know, obviously with more funds to spend, we get an opportunity to give that back to the community. So that's the end of my presentation. Hey, Peter Galatano from advisory and uh, I regret being late for those that were on time. You're 75% of the way there with self-funding. Why not make your job easy, push it to 100% self-funding, and then it's, a, it's almost like a revenue generating perpetuity into the future to fund all of those nice things that you haven't had the funds for. And you, all you have to do is ask the town, mother, may we use your field for a turf field? And, and that's an easy vote versus someone saying a million dollars, I have no kids or I don't use the fields or it's an extravagance or for 350 years, grass was good enough for Sherburn. Yeah. Well, I think we'll still get, if, if somebody was wondering whether or not grass is, you know, is good enough, we'll still get those questions, right? I don't know that it answers that, but we considered that. And, and to be fair, um, if we, if we can, we'd love to be, we'd love to raise all the money privately because then that means that there's no debt that we have to worry about. Um, but we haven't really started in earnest any of our fundraising. We didn't want to um, put off building the fields. And um, you know, certainly the, 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 the money from the town uh, gives us some assurance that you know, we get to that, that goal quicker. Um, so we're not going to stop at 3 million for sure. Um, but, but it's, uh, but certainly having that, uh, having that amount um, from the town gives us a, a nice start to get to where we want to be. I think I would add also, and I, you know, we recognize the fact that the municipal bond will be backed by the town of Sherborne, but we, we are trying to make it clear to folks in town that, you know, this is being funded by the revenue that comes in. And so while it may feel or seem as if a million dollars is being given by the town, in essence, that really is not the case because all of those debts are being paid for by the rec committee with the revenue from the field. Now, that's easy for us to say because anything could happen. We recognize that fact. So there is clearly risk, but uh, we are hoping to make it clear to constituents that this is being funded by rec entirely and not by taxpayers, hopefully. Gavin, and I was going along that path is you reduce the risk of the taxpayers by raising the funds over a number of years. And then you're the beneficiary of that increased revenue. So jack up all the rates for here into, you know, um, uh, perpetuity to fund the third uh, turf field or whatever other service expansion that rec requires because they're investing in those assets that have a return on investment now and well into the future. And yeah. the, the average citizen um, feels they're less at risk. Yeah, and that's a great point. I know that Dave talked about that a little bit as well, that our hope is to raise all of the funds through the fundraising. And if we have success at that and we're able to raise $4 million, I think at that point, what would most likely happen is that the bond is paid off immediately because we have those funds from the fundraising. And then, like you said, then that revenue can get used for plenty of other things as well, and it's no longer going back towards the bond. So yes, we would love and hope to raise the full amount from the fundraising, and the bond is kind of a you know, if we can't, then this bond helps us still build the field regardless. But our hope is to fundraise as much as we can to pay for the full cost. Hey guys, can I jump in with a question as, as far as timing goes? So uh, Steve Leahy here, part of the advisory okay. committee. So um, so is the ask to raise this million dollars here and now or at this next town vote, um, use that to start building and then work on the fundraising or, can, sorry, I may have missed like what the timeline is, but could you explain that again? Yeah, so we um, we would not use the town's money until we had the full amount raised. 
So, uh, you know, we need to be responsible. Obviously, we don't want to get, um, you know, partway through something and then realize we don't have enough funds. So we would, we would, you know, the process would be um, put it out to once we know the full scope, we know the, the materials and everything along those lines, put it out to bid, get an exact amount um, at the same time in parallel, do the fundraising and then make sure not only we have the funds to cover the full uh, construction costs, but we've got, you know, plenty for contingencies and what have you. Um, so no, we would not utilize the funds immediately. Uh, they would essentially just sit there uh, until we were ready to actually, uh, you, know, you know, start the project. Okay, and then uh, as a follow-up, as far as privately raising three or ideally four, the full amount, um, that, that's a pretty big number for some soccer fields. Do you guys already have some level of commitment from um, potentially large donors? So I, I can quickly answer that. And obviously for privacy of certain folks, I will not be uh, naming names, but uh, we already do have a donor who has made it clear that they believe they'll be able to donate a seven figure sum. You can say my name. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Thanks and we, you know, we've only just begun the process of the fundraising, right? So this is this is very early on. I have, you know, I, I have talked to others that have gone through this process. Um, I mean, we're hoping we can do it in as short as you know nine months, uh, but you know, it could take longer. And again, we don't know until we go out there just how successful we're going to be. We feel like we've got a good start, um, but but. You know the 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 money that the town essentially borrows on our behalf gives us the um, sort of the the uh, I, I suppose the assurance that if we only get part of the way there, we can we can begin the project. Thank you. I have a question about um, the the total sum needed. I I thought Dave, when you spoke to our advisory meeting, this was just two or three weeks ago. I thought at that time we were talking about a three million dollar project, two million to be privately funded, and one million still to come from the town. So how how did the cost go up by a million in the past two or three weeks? Yeah. So was, I have to admit, at that time, the estimate um, before we had completed the plan was about three point two. Um, when we added some of the parking improvements um, and when we, we started, we, we don't know exactly the final materials in terms of the infill and some of the, um, the, the, the totals for the turf. So we, we essentially um, assumed that we were gonna go with higher end uh, materials. So that's where some of that comes from. And, I, and the, other, the other thing that we're working on right now that we didn't know at that time is um, those fields are very low uh, and so we have to think about drainage for, uh, for, the, for the water off of the fields. Most of the, most of the water will go straight down um, because the, the entire field is permeable, but they're designed such that if, if, there, if water does pool, it has to go in a direction. Because those fields are so low, one of the things that we determined um, in the past couple of weeks is that we, we may have to raise the, the actual um, level of the fields by about two feet. So that added around 400,000 to the project as well. So, you know, as is typical with these things, it, it, it creeps. We feel like now we've included, you know, now, we've, now we have a better sense of the total scope of the project. We don't believe that there's any real gotchas in there. Um, we're still working on a, uh, you know, alternatives and, and are there ways for us to not have to spend that 400,000 to raise the fields, but it's in there should we need it. And going back to the timing question, I, I thought I had heard you say that you, you would not um, actually use the town's money until you had fully fundraised the rest so that we wouldn't be in a situation where there just wasn't enough money to finish the project. Correct. That's, if that's the case, and I, I don't know if our treasurer Heidi Doyle is on the line and I don't wanna put her on the spot, but I, Heidi, if you, if you would like to comment on timing of bonding because my assumption would be that, you know, until the funds were actually ready to be, were needed and ready to be spent, that we would not yet, you know, go out for bond. So if that's the case, by the time the fundraising happens, I'm wondering if this is premature for a couple of reasons. First, because you may have enough money from private funding. And second of all, because by the time you go through that process, and then we would do the bonding, if we're going to wait, you know, to make sure we have enough money, then it seems like, you know, we could be looking at Close to a year anyway, in, in terms of the total time necessary. 
Thanks, this is Heidi. Um, that is a concern I have because once the town votes on it, it's considered authorized. So it does count against our debt total, um, which even if we're not using it, it is something that the town is committed to. Um, I've heard there might be a chance, maybe there's a, a town fall meeting. I don't know if that's a possibility, but that might be something to think of if it gave a little more time to get this idea and uh, some more firmer numbers in place. But it is going to be hard to get a bond right now. And also, you can't pay back a long term bond usually quickly. So, this is something that would be a borrowing anticipation note that we would try to do um, and pay off over a couple of years as opposed to doing a long term bond where we'd, we'd actually get fav more favorable rates. Um, but it's something to consider. It would be considered authorized amounts for the town if we vote it this, this spring. And I should say we're, I mean, we're, we're hoping to raise the funds even sooner, right? I mean, if, if, if uh, our initial fundraising is, you know, is an indication of the interest in getting it done, then we could actually be ready to start the project sooner. So that's the, that's the reason for doing it now um, versus, versus potentially waiting. So, you know, again, if the, if the, if we think it's a, uh, a a reasonable request, and we're you know again the advisory committee and and the town and the select board is is satisfied with the numbers, then um, you know our hope is that we can we can do it sooner because that gives us flexibility to begin the project. Should we, you know, should we be able to accelerate the fundraising? I also think we have a, a time crunch because this would have to be a ballot question and the ballot questions are due, I think, April 6th. So it doesn't live a, give much time for advisory to come to a decision that should be on this warrant. Dave, is your intention not to really start your um, fundraising in earnest until this is approved by the town or you know, could you really start before the town actually gave you approval for the million? So we're going, we're not necessarily waiting for the town. I mean, um, we are putting together a fundraising committee as we speak. Uh, it's just, you know, it takes a little time to mobilize and, and get things moving. Um, so, so no, I don't, I don't think we would wait necessarily. Uh, I mean, but it's only a short period of time between now and when the, you know, when the town would vote and when the, I guess when the town would vote twice, right? So, uh, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna hold off on, on um, forming the fundraising committee until, until after the vote happens. So I don't, I don't know if Jackie, I don't think Jackie is on the, the line, but I, I have a question about what you just said, Heidi, about the timing, because if the ballot would have to be prepared by April 6th, um, advisory is not having its hearing until April 10th, so public hearing until April 10th. So how would that work timing wise? I mean, that's really uh, I guess, a question. Right. For Jackie, but... So I will have to, have to double check with Jackie then on when the questions have to come. But I think that's why the warrant questions were going to be on the select boards meetings, the next ones, that they were going to have to get that locked down. There uh, are still things that the ballots can get printed and then they'll say this question is that not valid, I think, but I'll text Jackie and see if I can get it for to come on this meeting. Or get so that would be a question in general for all the capital requests, right? Right. Getting them in time for the ballot. Yeah, I mean, this is it's definitely strays into a bigger overarching question, but I don't I don't recall in previous years advisory needing to make these decisions prior to the public hearing because one of the one of the questions for the ballot is also um, you know what is being um, paid for with borrowing versus free cash right because if it's free cash it doesn't need to go on there right so uh, so I know that we've been asked to make a determination for all of these capital items are we going to be recommending bonding versus free cash and I'm like we've never had to do this at this stage of of the preparation have we Steve <laughs> I don't believe so no yeah so so, so I, I admit that I'm a little bit confused about this timing um, but still 
What, what uh, makes you think you haven't had to do that? As far as determining whether we recommend financing vert as debt or free cash? Yeah. No, in a normal year, we'd have to fix the ballot. And if something's got, definitely going to go to free cash, you're not going to put it on the ballot. But I just it's don't all, feel it's like all, we... it's always this early. You might make a change later, but there's only one direction you can change later. If it needs to be on the ballot, it needs to be on the ballot. And normally free cash would be certified. So you'd know what you were going to try to spend. I just don't remember ever having had this discussion I in advisory meetings at this stage of, of the game. But well, normally you wouldn't have it when you're talking about a million dollar bond anyway. So, it, I mean, it, it's clearly not going to happen with this one, but we are going to have it in a couple, maybe an hour. Right. That's, and that's, that's why, you know, this year for each, each time we were talking about a capital item, uh, you know, I want advisory to also discuss um, free cash versus, versus bonding. I just don't recall having done that in the past, but. Um, Nor do I see. But anyways, I guess it, um, let me actually uh, uh, pause the advisory discussion. Uh, Marion Notre has had her hand up for a bit. So uh, Marion, uh, did you have something you wanted to ask? Uh, yes, if, if I miss this, uh, uh, I apologize, but I'm wondering uh, after 10 years, if this, if this field has a lifetime of 10 years, uh, what is the expense to the town after 10 years? What's the recurring expense every 10 years or when the field has to be uh, renovated? What's involved in that? How much will it cost? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't get into that in the in the presentation. So <clears throat> we mentioned that there's about 300,000 of anticipated revenue from the rentals of the field. The first 110 goes towards paying back the debt. Um, but there's another, there's about 120 that has to go aside to, um, as a field replacement fee. So we, the estimate right now is it's about 1.2 million um, to replace the field in 10 years. Sometimes they'll last a little bit longer. They'll go 12 or maybe even if we're lucky, 15 years. But um, the average is, is, is right around 10. So part of that, so it looks like on paper, okay, well, if you're making 300 Twenty thousand, and you you know your debt is is one hundred and ten. Like, look at all this money you got. But actually, we have to take a significant amount of that and put it aside for field replacement fees. So, so when I say it's self funding, it it should actually be entirely self funding. Um, the expectation is that even after we take off that extra one hundred and one hundred twenty thousand um, for the field replacement fee, we would still have some profit. Um, but you know, let's say we had a year we, we you know we didn't quite get up to that amount. Um, we would have to make it up in other years, and um, you know, and, and eventually get get enough to uh, to pay for the field replacement as well. Um, that does bring me, Dave, to one question um, that I had last time, which was um, obviously you know you're saying three hundred and twenty um, odd thousand dollars in revenue each year from these fields, but they are replacing existing fields, right? So my, one of my questions was whether you could estimate. What your annual revenue was from the existing configuration? Yeah, I I, I admit I tried to do that. <laughs> the fields have moved around so much, and we've we've leveraged that space in in different ways. I mean, the the I, I was not able to get to some number that I felt confident in terms of the the area we were replacing with with the new area. Um, it's it's. It's like an it's an order of magnitude difference, right? Okay. So we're talking about thirty thousand tops. I mean, the thirty thousand is what we would rent, you know, lease the entire, um, you know, Laurel area for in a given year. So if you take three of the fields, I, I don't know. Like I said, it, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't as easy to do as I had hoped it would be, but but yeah, we'd be stepping it up pretty significantly, almost in, in an almost comical way because we. You get so much time on those fields when you start talking about early spring and through the you know through the summer and the demand from um, not only our own youth programs but but external programs. So it it steps up pretty significantly. Okay, so it's I, not it's like not, it's not an exact number, but but I did look into it and like I said, it wasn't it it was it was like you know order of magnitude. Okay, so it's not like those fields are already bringing in one hundred and twenty thousand in revenue, and so actually 
your net increase is only 200,000. Not even, not, not even close, not even. Close. Okay. Yeah. I would also add Steve to that, that whatever revenue had been coming in from Laurel for field usage uh, on the natural grass would essentially either stay the same or increase on its own. So there isn't any lost revenue from taking that field space. There's enough grass area that uh, that usage can still happen and will still happen on those natural grass fields too. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, we're not we're not trying to um, um, necessarily rem it's like. Not Dane. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> The idea is to continue to, um, you know, leverage the natural grass fields. You know, even talking to some of the external uh, clubs that wanted to play, they express interest in both, right? So we're going to have an opportunity to continue to probably, even as a result of this project, optimize some of the layout by, you know, I mentioned some of the grading and trying to get, um, you know, better efficiency from the grass, from the natural area that we have. And so we may end up with actually um, the equivalent amount of space at Laurel for, for natural grass, even with adding these turf fields. Dave, having, and Gavin, having witnessed um, two other projects, one in Sherburn, one in Dover for turf fields uh, being proposed, being planned, and not being executed uh, for different reasons, because this is a revenue producing project, you have with your, within your own uh, ability as uh, fundraisers to ensure that this project does go through without the complexities of municipal financing, uh, taxpayer voting, timing. And so I, I suggest, not advise, but just su suggest as a taxpayer to stack the odds in your favor of getting this done and getting as close to that 4 million plus inflation, depending on how far out it goes, of fundraising. And then even if you're short, coming back to the town and saying, just help us close this gap and Heidi mentioned uh, a short-term borrowing note, which is, is you know, you, you borrow it and then you pay it off. It's on a long-term bond um, that has low favorable interest rates. That's more palatable because you've already put your money where your mouth is. And, and again, I've, I've been there with little kids and we can't play on the mud. You would love a turf field. And uh, each town has gone through that. At this point, you know, stack the deck in your favor. And if you can raise all of the money, then I go back to the residuals accrue to recreation uh, because you've already invested, you had the backing, and then all of the revenue generated, incremental revenue generated for those turf fields are yours to improve other areas of recreation. Yeah, understood. I mean, I, I guess I think we, in an ideal world, we end up in the same place, right? Which is whether or not, you know, ideally, you know, from our perspective, having the million dollars that we can draw on if we need to um, ensures that, you know, we can, we can begin the project and we can get this done. Um, with the understanding that the, the less debt we have to take on, the better off the rec department is. If we flip it around, you know, then we have the risk of waiting, um, you know, and obviously the delays and so forth that come with that. And do you mention inflation and so forth? But I think we, we potentially end up in the same place. If, if, if the numbers, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time with these numbers. We've, we've spent, we've looked at, we've talked to other towns, we've talked to clubs. We feel like there is no, I mean, in my mind, and obviously, you know, you guys would have to, you know, uh, feel this, you know, look at the numbers and be convinced of the same thing. But I don't see that there's any way that we don't generate the revenue to pay off the, the debt anyway. So it's like the risk to the town is essentially nothing. And it allows us to move forward with the project 
um, a lot sooner than if we had to wait again for a vote in a year, um, should we come up shy. So I think in an ideal world, we end up in the same place. It's just a question of what's the, what's the order of the, um, you know, the activities. Well, the risk of the town, and I'll, I'll rely on Heidi, is if we vote and the taxpayers support a million dollar uh, commitment, then that is actually on the books short term, or if we float the bond, then it is baked into the duration of that bond, including the interest. And so that's a commitment laid on future generations. Whereas uh, I'm just suggesting that if you do have the financial backing to garner the capital investment up front, all the dividends accrue to you well into the future. Completely understood. Yeah, no, 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 I, I get it. And and again, I mean, if, if we don't end up needing the money, then we, you know, the short term loan essentially gets paid off because it was never utilized. If we end up using the money, then it, the short term converts into a long term. And then, you know, again, we're right back to the same situation, which is we're paying that off every year through the through the revenue. Um, so I, I get what you're saying. It's, you know, it's kind of like, which do we do first, right? Do we try and go raise the money and then, you know, hopefully, hopefully get there. And then if we can't achieve it, then we, we wait. Um, or do we try and secure the money and then go off and, and, and raise the rest privately, which gives us an advantage um, to be able to start the project sooner um, and, and get kids out there playing sooner. So I, I get it. I guess that's just a, it's just a matter of, of preference or, you know, risk tolerance, but I, I, I completely get what you're saying. Where I'm coming from is every tranche of the population has their ask for their own needs in terms of capital. Yeah. And, and more so nowadays uh, with, with, you know, this roofs for certain buildings, uh, buildings for certain populations, and they're all asking the town for the same thing. Can you support us? Can you raise the funds? Can you raise the capital and support the debt uh, either privately like yourself or uh, through uh, taxes? Yeah, I guess the difference is I look at this as, a, as an asset that's generating revenue, right? So it's not a, it's not a handout where we're expecting the, the taxpayers of the, of the town to be responsible for paying off the debt. Right. We should we should more than have more than enough revenue that's coming in to pay off the debt. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it may I, I guess on the surface, it looks like, a you know, hey, this is this is a capital expense that the town has to, you know, has to end up being responsible for. But in the end, you know, we're going to pay it off ourselves. And Dave, this is, this is Bo O'Connell, one of the other rec committee members. The one other, I think, conversation we've had, uh, Peter, just to your point on past projects um, getting to a certain, you know, a certain point and not actually happening. You know, we look at this with, you know, with the town kind of green lighting that as a, as a sign or a recognition that, you know, that we go raise that additional 3 million or, or whatever the final number is. You know, the town is is supporting it, um, or towns. Um, this is just Sherman, but that was one of the conversations we had around. There's been past projects I think that have been fully funded, and they didn't get where they needed, or they didn't get to the the, the finish line, so to speak. So that's kind of one of the other conversation points that we've had as a group to say that, you know, this kind of says that, yeah, we'll we'll go raise this money, and yes the town of Sherburn is behind the project in a, you know, from a scoping perspective. Yeah, it helps with the optics when we go to raise the money as well, right? Because it actually could potentially accelerate us there because there's, there's a feeling that it's a real project. Thanks. Um, I see that uh, Jackie Morris, the town clerk is um, on now. I actually have forgotten the details of the question that we wanted to ask her, but uh, if uh, Peter and Heidi, I think you guys were the ones that had, had oh no, I think it was Jane and, and Heidi that had started bringing that stuff up that was like, oh, we need Jackie to answer this. But what, 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 were the, what were the specifics of the question again? 
uh, Steve, I can tell you. So the concern I had was the ballot questions have to be printed up and I was told the ballots ha have to go to Jackie by April 6th, even though our town meeting isn't later. And um, approval is a two, it's gonna be a two-step process. You're gonna get it approved at town meeting, but then the ballot will have to take, voting has to take place by the town in June. So I just wanted Jackie to go over the timing of the steps. Hi. So, yeah, so the, the reason that the ballot questions are due April 6th, it has to do with Mass General Law and Sherman bylaws. So Mass General Law calls that all the ballot questions have to be given to the town clerk 35 days before the election. So even though the election has been continued to June 15th, it's based on Sherman bylaws. So chapter one, section one, of the Sherman bylaws calls that our annual town election will always be the second Tuesday in May. So that is why, even though the election date has been moved out, the ballot questions still have to be given to me by April 6th. So I know it's a short timeline, but that's what happened last year too. Um, the, so I think that the select board is going to start discussing those based on my discussion with Diane Morris. Um, I think they're going to start talking about the ballot questions on March 18th and then possibly continue to April, uh, the meeting April 1st. But yeah, that's um, unfortunately, that's the deal. I have to have the ballot questions by April 6th. Okay. Thank you, Jackie. You're welcome. Um, any more questions or comments from advisory um, for the rec committee? And is there any uh, public comment or questions? And if, if possible, if you could use the, the raise hand feature of the, um, the chat, if you have any questions or comments. <clears throat> All right, well, hearing none, um, I think, I think uh, that's it for you guys. And just so you know, Dave, I didn't actually time it, but I think your presentation was uh, uh, well over five minutes, so you may have. To... <laughs> I added probably just the... as I was going along, so yeah. Yeah, I it's just the... need to trim it down. You, you had a, the appropriate number of slides. I think you just talked about each one of it. So much, so. <laughs> just practice thanks it for... before the public hearing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, thanks for letting me know. I knew, I knew as I was going, I was going a little long, but yeah, that's all right. Thanks for all right. Me. Thank you guys. All right, thanks everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care. All right, next we have uh, Wendy Alassi, the um, assessor with two items, the revaluation certification and the assessor law. And again, um, Wendy, if you have something that you want to screen share, you should be able to, but obviously you don't, you don't have to if you don't need to. Yeah, um, so I don't need to, but I just wanted, and I, I just realized um, that the utility conversation about the NSTAR Eversource that we were having at the last meeting I spoke at, we were going to also discuss that at this meeting. Um, and I didn't see it on the agenda, but it's it's pretty important. So if you'd like, I can talk about it briefly. These should all be fairly brief. Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'm going to start with um, the new, what I call the unfunded state mandate um, that assessors and towns are mandated in order to pass certification that they have to um, have a valuation company do an independent valuation on our two utility accounts. And currently the, our combined utilities are approximately 19 million. 71 communities were in a revaluation year in fiscal 21 and they were mandated for revaluation purposes to get this valuation. The average of the 71 communities that had the independent valuation, the value, the overall value of their utilities increased by 46%. So it all sounds like great news, but so right now we're at 19 million with the 46% and this is average 
it would bring the value up an additional 8.8 .8 million. So currently they're paying a tax of $375,247. For fiscal 22, if in fact the independent valuation shows the average at 46%, they would owe a tax of $547,990. However, this is this mandate and this new way of doing valuation was adjudicated at the appellate tax board. However, every community who did the independent valuation sent out tax bills. Most of the utility companies only paid 50% of their taxes, which is accepted by for personal property tax. As long as you pay 50%, 5-0 of your taxes for the year, when you file an abatement, that's all you have to do is pay 50%. It's chapter 5964. So instead of receiving the 547, we will receive, if, if we were to get the valuation, of the almost 30 million, we should be receiving 547,000. Currently we receive 375,000. They only have to pay 50% of their taxes for this year. They'll be paying $101,000 less than we are used to receiving. So in, in addition to that, this year, we have $156,000 in our excess overlay and our overlay um, that's built into the budget for 22 is 165,000. So for this year, we're, we're all set um, and we could cover if we, if we were to lose at the appellate tax board because all of these cases are being tried. If we lose at the appellate tax board, we would have the money in our overlay to pay them back. This process can take three to four years. And so every year they'll receive a, an updated tax bill. They will file an abatement they will pay 50% of their taxes. And then we need to have enough money if we lose at the you know, Supreme Judicial Court because they'll probably bring it up to the SJC to cover that. So it really, in, a, in essence, reduces our revenue by for this year, for example, if, and again, I'm, I'm going on the average of the 46%, reduces our revenue by 101,000. However, the value is built in. So it's almost going to lower the tax rate in an almost artificially, right? With the new growth and the new value. So, you know, we can, this can be the first conversation that we have about this. And we can, you know, try to think of ways to um, report it and how it's going to impact this, not so much this year, but I'm, I'm more concerned about the following years when we have to continue to, you know, put this money away or aside to cover ourselves in, in the case, in, if we have to return the money. Wendy, what has the appeals uh, verdicts been uh, in prior cases? Um, so at the appellate, it's only taken to the appellate tax board level and they have agreed and sided with the assessors. Um, they are going back to the appellate tax board. They'll go through that process and then they are planning on elevating it to the um, SJC. One of the things we're doing now, and we're all just kind of scrambling as assessors, um, 
they're actually creating or develop, putting together a committee. Um, the Massachusetts Assessors Association is actually putting together a committee because everyone's calling each other with questions and there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, so I'm coming to you with all of the information that I have right now. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call some co other communities who have received abatement applications I'm going to see, um, you know, I might call 10 and say, did all of them only pay 50%? Did, you know, it, try to figure it out. So we're all just trying to figure it out. Um, but I thought it was very important to bring this to you guys now. Um, and again, this is, we could, this can be the beginning of the conversation. You guys can put your heads together think about how it's going to impact the rate. Um, Sharon and I talked about it a little bit about the overlay. Um, so if you want, because I know you guys have a long night, I can certainly, you can send me any questions you have and um, we can navigate this. This is new to me as it is to you. Yeah, what would be important is the success at the um, appellate level of court adjudication. And if the towns have all won and it's going to the next level, that's different than it's a 50-50 toss up who wins at that level. Right, right. This happened um, in 2012, um, something very similar with Verizon. And um, we actually, and this is what, concerns me is um, money was, we had to give money back. And um, some communities did not do what was fiscally responsible and they spent the money and it was a real hardship on them. So I've seen, I've seen it go the other way, right? I've seen it approved at the appellate tax board and they lose at the SJC. You know, so for me, um, and I'm conservative anyway. I, I always try to take the conservative approach, and I have seen firsthand what it, what it, what this situation has done to communities who do not retain the money and make sure they have enough if they have to pay it back. And so, and what would be helpful is what was the valuation based on in twelve versus twenty one. Uh, because you may have been playing fast and loose with valuations back then, and I'm assuming if, if uh, decisions were in the favor of the utilities, if we have a slam dunk case now because we've been undervaluing those parcels, that makes a difference. So, yes, you know, I can find some case law. I think, yeah, I think there's one case law on this. Um, this started, I believe, in Lawrence or Lowell. Um, and so I can look up that case law and I can certainly send that over to you and you guys can take a look at it, that's fine. Um, and like I said, I actually, I'm going to find out if it originated in Lowell or Lawrence and I can also talk to their assessor as well. Um, but I have seen, unfortunately, that it went through the ATB, they sided with us, it went to the SJC, and there was a world of hurt for a lot of communities who thought it was gonna go the other way. So it's, you know. Hey, hey, um, man, Wendy, I've got a, a couple of questions. Um, sure. One is you said the average was 46%. Um, Do you know what the range was? Like what the low and the high? Um, among those no, they had, I was on a call and they had, said, they had just said that the average was 46%, um, it, you know, and I've thought about, you know, lowering it to even be a little more to be, you know, I, I don't know, or, or raising yeah. it. I don't, you know, um, okay. but yeah. you don't have the range anyways. No, I um, don't have the range. And then the other, the other question is, do you know what the typical timing is for when an appeal goes to the SJC? Like how long does that process take before a ruling yes. is made? Yep. So the average is about three to five years. 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 Yes. That's why. Yes. So that's why I had said, you know, for the next, you know, three. So next this year or fiscal 22, we should be okay. 
However, we will be, if it's going the way we think it's going, currently they're paying on this current value, 375,000, right? When I get the, the valuation report back from the independent um, appraiser, let's just, and I'm going on, let's just say it's going to go up by 46% the taxes will increase from fiscal 21 at 375,000 to 547,000. But because of the law, that's chapter 59, section 64, where it states that for personal property own, only, they only have to pay 50% of their taxes. That brings our taxes our revenue down to 273, 995. So, so effectively, instead of paying 100% of what they're paying right now, they'll pay 73% of what they're paying right now. And yes, they would continue doing that every year until the yes. SJC. Mm -hmm. okay. They'll file then, every year. Yeah. And then if yeah. the SJC rules in favor of the town, then all of a sudden, as a lump sum, all of that, all of that excess money gets dumped into. into yes, the I have fund. a party. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I have a party if that happens. Uh, yes. And, and but it is very, all at once, basically. All at once. Yes. Yeah. That that's you know, and and again, there's I've seen um, some cases. I've spent quite a bit of time at the appellate tax board. Um, there's also the talk of you know, sometimes they'll make a settlement where they'll say, okay, we'll give you this, but we want you to waive all of the interest or we want you to, you know, so, so there's some back and forth. Um, I've already spoken to uh, an appellate tax board attorney um, and he's given me some, you know, some information on this as well. So, um, but okay. for right now, this is what we know. And, um, I'll do some further digging, but I wanted to mention it tonight because I think that you should all know okay. this. So in the in the interest of time, I do also want to clarify that for this year's town meeting on this warrant, mm -hmm. this is not really the issue. The, the issue is simply that this revaluation has to happen. It's going to cost a certain amount of money to make it happen, mm -hmm. and that's yes. not up for debate, right? Correct. It's just, yes. It, so, it's a mandate okay. has to be done. So yes. the fact that this is the background and there are these repercussions, that's all good to know, but we don't actually need to discuss that currently, right? Exactly. What what will affect and what will impact us as as of July first is we will be potentially receiving one hundred and one thousand dollars less in revenue. Right. based on our value. So it's going yeah. to look like we have an additional $100,000 when we we really don't. Yeah. Because it's going to be tied up. So right. that's where you guys come in and Deb and Sharon and you know I, I don't know how you guys want to look at it. I mean for every 13,000 it's a penny, right? So um but Wendy, yeah, I just but, want to be clear. Are are you saying that the overlay? I think you said that the overlay this year could cover that. So do you mean that the overlay could be released to make up that hundred thousand dollar difference in the operating no. cover the operating budget? No, we need to keep we need to keep the um, money in the overlay. Um, if we need to refund so they we were basically told by the state to double our overlay um but i see i don't understand that because if they're paying less than what they're are, are you saying that the valuation could go down it wouldn't even be what it currently is so so let's just say um let's just say we lose right and and let's and, and they said let's go on the assumption that they pay 100% of this, right? And then we have to give it back to them. We need to have enough money in our overlay to refund that money. So they said to make sure that you increase your overlay to a point where 
Right. This is if so they pay the 100%. For this year, we're okay. Okay. Right, right. Okay. But they said that that's how we have to do it because if they pay us 100%, you know, and then, yeah. So, then we might owe them money okay. back. So you're saying we better not spend that money because because right. we might have to give it back to them. But on the other side right. of the coin, if they only pay the 50% and now we have $100,000 less in the kitty than we expected mm -hmm. to have, are you right. saying that advisory for FY22 needs to basically figure out a way to come up with an extra $100,000 because we may well not have it? Right. So the way that I, so the way that I'm looking at it, and there's a lot of kind of moving parts of this, right? So um, they would still owe us um, a one hundred thousand dollars, right? So if they're only paying fifty percent of the new valuation for the year, they're still they're paying a hundred and one thousand dollars less in taxes. So if if they were to win, they would they would actually owe us some money. So again, there's a lot of moving parts, um, and I that think wouldn't happen if, until three to five years from now. Also, three right? to five years from now. That's the problem. Right. 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 So, but, right. so, but currently then the issue just becomes how much of their um, tax bill are they going to pay? Right. Exactly. And so yeah. depending on how much they choose to pay, that will leave the town's current fiscal year revenue, either a little bit behind what we thought or a bit right. ahead of what we thought. If it's yep. ahead of what we thought, we just have to be careful not to actually spend that. But if it's mm -hmm. behind what we thought, mm -hmm. you know, are we still not allowed to use the overlay to cover that difference? Because it's not like right. there's some so, chance that we're going to be, if they only pay 50%, there's not any chance that we are still going to have to give them even more money back, right? Like if they only pay 50% of their bill, eventually they're going to have to give us more money. Right. All right. But they said, you know, you, you can't bank on, you can't bank on them only paying 50%. So, so right now, so what happens is I'm going to give you a new growth number, right? And that new growth number is going to be, you know, so you've got the 8.8 .8 million in additional value. So that's $172,000 in growth um, and an additional $8.8 .8 million of our overall valuation. So that's going to affect, it's going to look like we have an additional $172,000 of revenue coming in, but we're really not. So are you saying we might be a total of 272 short if 172 because yes, 273. Well, they're getting it, but we're, you know, but it's not really real. And then a hundred because if they pay the 50%, right, then we right. don't get that money. So we might be 272,000 short in FY22, you're saying. 273,995. So we, we do have to figure out what to do about that for FY22, right? I mean, to right. Steve's point, yes. this is not just a, a future thing, right? We have an immediate No, this problem. is, that's why we're having, yes, that's why we're having this conversation now because it's going to affect this year's budget. The overlay, the overlay is okay right now. That, that's okay, that's fine. But like I said in the beginning, it, it is going to affect the tax rate and it's going to affect the revenue. So how do you not count the $172,000 of new growth or, or the revenue in, in the budget? How do you remove that from the model so you get a real? Are you, rate? the 172,000, when you go to calculate a tax rate, are you allowed to basically not include that in the calculation? No, it ha everything has to go in. So what, what I- You can't pretend completely. that we don't have that. <laughs> no, <laughs> I can't, I know, I know. So, um, you know what I could do is um, I can call around, maybe I'll do like five 
to 10 communities and see how they're handling it in their budgets. And, um, you know, maybe talk, you know, chat with Sharon and see what we can come up with. Um, I tend to, as you know, I'm on the assessing side of it. And um, so why I'm bringing it to you guys. Yeah. So I guess the question is, okay, when, when do we need to figure out a strategy for this? Do we need to have a strategy for this prior to the public hearing so that, so that our strategy is baked into the omnibus budget? Okay. Or is this just something that we need to figure out when it's time to calculate the tax rates? Right. You know, because if know. we need to, if we need to sort this out before the public hearing, then it's like, okay, yeah. I mean, I still, I don't. I've spent more time than I intended on this topic tonight, and and I. Sorry. Would, if we, yeah. If we don't have to talk about it tonight, I would prefer to stop talking we about it. Okay. Yes, I agree. So I would, I would propose that we stop talking about this right now. I recognize mm -hmm. that this is important, um, but I, all of the other people who are on this call don't really need to hear this discussion right now. Right. Um, well, I and we're I still get my two warrant articles and a lot of them. So. Yes. So, um, yeah. so what I would propose, because I think we're, this, we're going to talk about this later, but we're going to have another advisory meeting on uh, March 24th. Um, and then okay. um, our public hearing is going to be on April 10th. Um, Ten. So, yeah, perfect. so I, I would propose that we table this discussion until March 24th at the, at the, at the earliest. Um, and then if we need to, if we need to hammer something out before the public hearing, then we can, we can, we can do something probably offline. Um, sure. That sounds tonight, good. It's like, it is important that we know what's going on, but we don't have to, yeah. we don't have to come up with an answer tonight. And so let's exactly. I just truly wanted to bring it to your, um, yeah. your attention. So All if right. you, so if can you'd you move like, on to your next thing, yep, I'm going to move on to, um, the warrant article. But I want to be clear, the revalues that this will cost money, right? We, the, just the certification process itself that costs some oh, X I'm, number I'm of sorry. thousands of dollars, right? Oh, okay. So are we doing, we're going to do the FY23 re reval, revaluation? Yeah, because you have an article. actual warrant article, right? So, so, this, so we do need so to know pre precisely what you're going to be presenting at town meeting and what everyone's going to be voting on. Okay. Um, are you, I just want to make sure that the $5,000 that it came to ask you for, for the valuation of utilities is separate from this article. Did you... Are you confusing uh, the two or? I might be confusing the two. Okay, yeah. So this... was that $5,000 just going into your operating budget? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay, so then what's the warrant article? Okay, so the warrant article is um, for our fiscal 23 revaluation. Um, this is the first, so the last value revaluation we have was in fiscal 2018. It used to be a triennial. Now it's every five years. Every few years, the assessor comes to you and um, or comes to the town meeting and requests to raise and appropriate the funds of this year or this this reval of sixteen thousand um, dollars to undertake the reval revaluation of the town's real and personal property for the purpose of receiving recertification by the Department of Revenue. And it will employ experts to assist them in such a revaluation to enter into compensation contracts on behalf of the town. Um, so essentially, this is something that was done every three years. And the last go around, it was about $12,000 this year. So it's, it'll be every five years, and it is $16,000. And we will use... Three bids? Yes. Did we get three um, bids, or is this just... The, the last firm that did it is going to do it again. So we have a camera system, a computer um, appraisal system, and the um, developers are Patriot Property and they're our vendor. And historically, we have always used this vendor. Um, they're reasonable. Um, they can connect um, to the server 
from their office, they will um, come in and they will be able to work. And um, they have a team, a large team of people um, who will come out and do this. How does Advantage translate into the best price is what I'm asking. Well, we don't know that, we're just assuming that. Um, I do know that just because of my, um, just because of my um, knowledge of, of assessing and revaluations, um, that it is a very fair price. And um, also, um, I don't know, is David, are you on the call as the chief procurement officer? Is, do you know if any, anyone know if David's on the call? Uh, I don't. And I'm the chief procurement officer. What evidence do you have that would support that they're the best price? Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> David's not on the call. Okay, um, so I just wanted to let you know that. Um, I, I mean, I can certainly try to go out to bid for this. Um, I was told because they are an expert. Um, we have you know, been using them. They're our camera system. It's best practice to use essentially your, the person who supports your camera, your, your system um, is the best way to go. So, I mean, if, if you want, I can start the process and get three bids, but because this is um, one of those where it's, it's an expert, it's best practice. Um, these, this particular does not have to go out to bed. Wendy, can I make a comment? Yes, please. This would be exempt from bidding at $16,000 under 30B as a Thank professional you. service. You'd be using best practices. We, we don't put all the professional services out to bid every time we use them. Thanks, Sean, you said that better than I did. <laughs> Um, okay, so revaluation 16,000 happens every five years now. Now, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Sean, did you have something else you want to say? Your hand is uh, still up. I did. Um, why would we put this to the town voters? Is this required by law? Um, it, it, it's, it's a guideline. It's, a, it's a, it's a it's guideline. A best is it a best practice? It's a, it is a best practice, and this is just how it's been done. Um, and because it stays in an account, and I will be using this, I will start using these funds in 22, and I won't finish using them. So it's um, Sharon, if you want to jump in, I forget the name of the of the account that it is. So it um, it's a certain. It doesn't go from year to year. So it rolls over from year to year. And so that's a, that's why I was told it had to go to town meeting. Sharon, are you on? I don't think that's or a good it. reason to go to town meeting, but it seems like it's ridiculous to ask the taxpayers to vote on something that they don't have a choice. That, uh, exactly. Yeah. Wendy, I am on. It's just because it rolls over because it, the expense doesn't get out incurred in one year. So we have to okay, roll it that's over. Right. Right, so that's why it has to be a warrant article, right? Correct. That's what I was told. Okay. All right. Yeah, so that's why, Sean. I mean, the other way I could do it is I could put 8,000 in my budget for 22 and 8,000 in my budget for 23 and not have to go to town meeting. Um, maybe that's something to think of in the because I, I agree with you, Sean. I mean, to have to go to town meeting with this when it's something that we have to do essentially to get certified. Um, I'm just trying to shorten tonight's meeting, actually. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I've only been on for 20 minutes. Um, all right. Does anybody from advisory have any questions or comments about the revaluation certification? Yeah, I, I'll just go on the record saying I'm supportive of, you know, of the, the Warren article. I'm also supportive, Wendy, if you just wanted to put an $8,000 line item in your budget for this year and next year, um, just uh, just to streamline this, because I, th I 
agree completely with the sentiment that Sean and Wendy have expressed that, you know, this is not really something that represents an exercise of um, discretion for the town. Right. You have to get this revaluation done under state law. And so, you know, it's, I guess it's easier for the accounting to have a single account to fund it all at once and then to allow it to be drawn on for a couple of fiscal years. But, um, you know, it might just be, it might just be simpler and it might, you know, it might save a few hours. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it would be great for me if everybody else agrees. I mean, it, that's kind of what always made sense to me, but I understood that because it was going to be year to year, this is the way we had to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think, Wendy, the first time you called me weeks ago and told me about this, I think that was my first question, right? Was you like, said, why are you can doing you just that? Yeah. Yeah, can't you just bake this into your operating budget over however many years you need the money? And, you know, I think you indicated that for one reason or another, it needed to go to town meeting. But if you, yeah. if you can, if you can determine that it doesn't actually need to go to town meeting and that it can simply be baked into your um, budget, well, it can because they're going to be starting work this July. So, you know, I can just say we're going to do, you know, X amount this year and X amount the following year, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, because if, if we know that either way it's being paid for in this year's budget, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we're, you know, it's, it it doesn't it doesn't affect the omnibus in the end, right? It's just a matter of right. Did we tie right. everybody up or not? So. So, all right, yeah. so can you can you go back yeah, so, to the drawing board on that and try to figure out um, yes. if, if uh, there's, there's just ensure that there is no legal reason why you can't do that. And then yeah. I, would, I would probably propose unless any on, the, on advisory has an objection that, that you do that, essentially just put this into your, into your budget. If it's 8,000 this year, 8,000 next year and yeah. um, pull, this, uh, pull this article from the board. Yep, the only thing I would need to do legal wise is I would need um, an email from the finance director um, to the to Patriot property just saying um, and to the and I'll forward it to the Department of Revenue saying that it's going to be funded. We have to sh we have to show when we do our report um, for our reval, which I'll be doing that we have the funding for it. So if I have something from fi the finance director stating that they're giving me $8,000 this year and you'll be you know, granting 8,000 next year, that shows the Department of Revenue proof that I do have the funding to go forward with the reval. So that's all I'd need to do. Great, can you work on that and bring that back to us on March 24th? 24th, sure, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, right. next, and then your other next thing? one, it should be, it should be fairly quick. Um, I'm very excited about this. This is the exception of uh, acceptance of local option to tax new construction and um, to see if the town will vote to accept provisions of section 40 chapter 653 and essentially to um, get through this quickly. This gives the assessor um, the ability to collect data and of new construction, new structures, additions, any new improvements that are affixed to the property from January 2nd till June 30th of, of the year. And then I can be, begin taxing them right away. Um, what happens now is it's how the property stood on January 1. So I'll give you a very quick example. I contacted Chris Canny and I asked him if he could give me the most recent building permits uh, or occupancy permits that he's received um, or issued in, um, since January 1st. And from January 2nd to date, um, there is about $5 million in growth, which, will, which I will be able, if this is accepted, to start taxing on January, on July 1st. So that's an additional $100,000. And we're only into March this year. So I would imagine that it will be at least doubled by the time June 30th hits. And so will that cover the, uh, the utilities shorting their taxes then? <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
And then in addition, in, in, in addition to that, um, this will also allow us to do supplemental billing. And so properties that receive their occupancy permits from January 2nd through June 30th, I can give them a supplemental bill. So th that's also bringing in additional revenue. Um, so it, it's, it's a win, it's a win-win. Um, it, it's going to be really great now that we're quarterly, um, that will give me an opportunity to get all of the information into the system. Um, and we will be able to start doing supplemental and we will be able to, able to collect new construction until the 30th of June, which is to me very exciting. Great. And does this cost does this cost the town any money? No. No, it costs the town no money. Great. It makes them money. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Peter. I, I was just restating what you said. This seems to be a fair and universal benefit to all taxpayers. Yes. Yes. Great. Any okay. questions or comments from advisory? All right. Any public questions or comments? All right, sounds good. Thank you. All right, thank you, Wendy. Thanks. All right, um, okay, moving on, we now have the two um, citizens petitions. Um, first, it's uh, the ban on the sale of for products. Um, Jeanette um, Slickenmeyer, hopefully I um, said that correctly. Uh, I do I do have a few comments before we start here. First, um, I've noticed um, obviously we have a few uh, people from out of town um, on the, on the um, meeting currently. So I just want to remind everybody that if you are going to speak um, to please just state your name and then if you are a Sherborne resident to state um, your address, your street address is just the street you live on is fine. And if you are, um, not a Sherborne resident, uh, please just state your um, affiliation just so that um, we know who everybody is. Um, the other thing that I want to mention, um, just as a full disclosure uh, on these, because both of these uh, citizens' petitions are sort of animal rights um, um, articles. Um, so I am a veterinarian and I am employed by the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Um, I work in their specialty hospital, but it is the umbrella of the uh, MSPCA. Um, neither the, uh, the MSPCA is not the official sponsor of either of these. And I don't believe that there is any um, financial um, conflict of interest because I don't believe that the MSPCA is going to fire me or penalize me should the town fail to pass either of these, but still I wanted to disclose that fully. And I wanted to open the floor to anybody who felt that there was a conflict of interest and whether I should um, either abstain uh, from voting or recuse myself completely from the discussion. So that's the first question that I had is if anybody sees a problem with me um, maintaining my, my um, role as the chair for these articles. Uh, great. So um, I guess we'll um, start, Jeanette. If you have a um, presentation, um, you should be able to screen share it. OK, great. Yes, I do. I would like to give a brief presentation. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. Are you still there, Jeanette? I am here. Uh huh. Okay. Because I, I, I don't see your screen currently. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm getting. That's right. I'm getting it together here. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Great. What you will hear from me in the next five minutes is first about the proposed bylaw. Second, about the animals that are affected by the fur industry. Third, about the environmental impact of the fur industry. 
and fourth, about the alternatives for fur for, 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 and fifth is the danger to the public health from the fur industry. The proposed fur byproducts bylaw would make it unlawful to sell, offer for sale, display for sale, trade or distribute for monetary or non-monetary value fur products in the town of Sherboard. Fur products include articles of clothing and accessories and home accessories and decor that are made in whole or part of fur. The bylaw provides reasonable exemptions for leather, cowhide, shearling, fur used in tribal or cultural purposes and used fur. The proposed bylaw does not prohibit the possession of fur products nor the purchase of fur products outside of Sherborne. You may want to know why in the past, or you may know that in the past, Sherborne, Sherborne voters have consistently voted in favor of animal welfare legislation. In 1996, 80 or 68% voted in favor of banning leg hold traps. In 2008, 68% voted in favor of banning greyhound racing. And in 2016, 78% voted in favor of ending the cruel confinement of farm animals. And you may wonder why Sherborne residents need this bylaw when there are no local businesses selling fur. This bylaw represents the core values of the residents of Sherborne. It tells would-be retailers that selling fur does not reflect the values of the town residents and is not welcome here. The fur industry exploits several species of fur-bearing animals. The latest figures estimate 100 million Yes, 100 million animals are killed annually just for their fur. And that does not even count rabbits where several hundred million are killed each year. Fur animals live in tiny filthy cages where they literally lose their minds from confinement before they are killed by the harshest of means. Anal electrocution, suffocation, clubbing, often being incapacitated, but still alive and conscious when they are skinned. This has been repeatedly documented on fur farms in China, which is the source for 80% of the fur sold in the United States. There are videos of these investigations on furfreema.com, and I would urge you to look for yourselves at what goes on in this industry. Trapping contributes only a small percentage of fur, but still over 5 million animals are caught in traps annually. These archaic and indiscriminate traps often maim or kill non-target animals, including threatened species and pets. These animals often die slowly by drowning, predation, shock, injury, or blood loss. If they are found alive, they're frequently clubbed or suffocated in order to preserve the pelt's value. Massachusetts has outlawed the use of snares along with body gripping, leg hold, and conibear traps. Unfortunately, their use is still common elsewhere in the United States. The fur industry hurts the environment. Fur farms require vast amounts of feed and water and produce massive amounts of manure. This contaminates soil and waterways. Fur production requires the use of toxic chemicals like chromium and formaldehyde, which are also potential pollutants. Sherborne alone cannot solve the world's environmental problems but this law will be a step in the right direction. The good news is that there's currently cruelty-free alternatives. Today, faux fur is considered virtually indistinguishable from animal fur and is preferred by many fashion designers. Over 300 fashion brands and retailers across the globe are now fur-free. The fur production spreads COVID-19 and possibly other infectious diseases. You may have heard last summer that COVID-19 spread throughout hundreds of factory fur farms across Europe, as well as fur farms in Utah, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Oregon. Research shows that farmed mink spread mutated viruses to humans, and the mutations might reduce the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines. These health risks led European governments to kill nearly 20 million minks in order to protect the public health. France and the Netherlands banned fur farming, and Israel has banned the fur trade. 
Support for the fur ban will align Sherborne with over 80% of the state's population on an issue of animal cruelty and environmental damage of a staggering scale. Fur bans have been passed in California and recently in Wellesley. And with your support of this bylaw, I hope Sherborne will be the next. Thank you again for the opportunity to present the citizens petition. Steve, you're, mute, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, uh, before I open the floor to advisory, I'd like to open the floor to uh, public for any questions or comments. Um, and I ask that you use the raise hand feature um, uh, and just be recognized by me um, first before you speak. All right, seeing no public comments, I'll open the floor to uh, advisory uh, for any questions or comments for Jeanette. Um, is wool fur? No, wool is not fur. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'll be honest, you know, I think I, nobody is in favor of the cruelty and the, the treatment of animals that, um, that's been raised in the presentation. Um, but I'm curious, like, you know, why, why right now? You, you touched on it a little bit in the presentation, but, um, but I'm curious just kind of what's motivating it for this year in particular. And do you, do you feel like there's some imminent, um, you know, threat of, of fur being sold in town or just could, could you just elaborate a little bit on kind of what um, uh, what moved you to bring the, the petition this year? Um, what moved me was the ban that the state of California put on the sale of fur and the most recent ban in uh, our neighbor's town of Wellesley. And I think this is a movement that is uh, coming up and I would like to be a part of it. I think it's very important. It's very important to me. Um, I've worked for years and years on trying to promote humane um, legislation. I have you know, traveled to Washington DC and visited our senators and um, our representative Catherine Clark and Senator Markey and Senator Warren. Um, before COVID, I was down at the state house lobbying for um, the various state animal protection laws that are up. And last Friday, I was on a Zoom call with our Senator Rausch. And it's just uh, something that's very important to me. And I think there's a movement here. And now is a good time. And especially with the COVID outbreak, it just, I think it's a very good example of the harm that we do to the planet and to our species and to other species in the way we treat animals. And now is a good time. There's never a bad time to start doing the right thing. Okay, yeah, that's fair enough. All right. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for that. You're welcome. Um, and as, as, far, as far as you're aware, as far as I'm aware, there are not, but there are no businesses currently in Sherborne that sell fur. And in fact, I don't believe we have any clothing retailers at all in town, right? So right. this um, bylaw would not affect any of the current businesses in town. Is that true, as far as you're aware? Yes, that's true. It's a preemptive, you know, because I can see someday, who knows, a little boutique or something opening up, opening up in Sherborne. And I believe it's easier to get bylaws like this through when we are not hurting current businesses. And um, even though Wellesley did get one, we get theirs passed, um, having businesses in town that did sell for, but it was such a small percentage of their sales that, you know, they did admit it really would not hurt their bottom line. Um, thank you. I guess um, I'll just sort of state my my position on the issue, um, 
which is probably, I don't know, it might be more neutral than my position on it personally, but my position as the advisory chair, you know, I don't believe that this um, petition, because I don't think that it has any immediate economic um, uh, ramification for the town. Um, it is, in fact, you know, it's essentially just a vote of the town's, uh, you know, the, the resident population's ethics and morality. And it's a question that needs to simply be voted on by um, the, the residents of the town at town meeting. Um, so so I, in my function as the advisory chair, I would say that I am probably neutral on this um, petition because, because of the fact that there are no particular financial ramifications. I am of course, personally in favor of it and I will vote uh, you know, in favor of it, um, but, uh, uh, you know, that is essentially how I feel uh, from advisory's perspective is that um, this is the type of thing that our job, I feel, is to essentially just, you know, pass it along to the town. It's on the warrant. We can't take it off the warrant because it's a citizen's petition. Um, and I see I see no good reason why advisory um, uh, as a group should should not be in favor of it uh, because it's simply something that that the town should just vote their own conscience on. But that's Thank my you. position. Well, Stephen, can I just ask the follow-up question? Do we need, in your view, does advisory need to take a position on this? Because it feels like, you know, I can't judge sort of the reach of the provisions here, but it does feel like a pretty binary vote, right? Like either this reflects your values or it doesn't. And I don't know yeah. what we have to add to that. I. I think just because uh, in our function of on advisory, we do need to have a motion at town meeting. Um, so we, we, we do have to have a vote because we, we need to vote to recommend either, you know, positive favorable action or no action on, on this petition. Um, so, so as advisory, I, I believe that we do have to take a vote on it. I mean, at the public hearing, of course, but you know, I think if we had the option to just say, uh, I don't know, maybe we could all abstain. I'd have to check with the moderator to see if we're allowed to do that. But uh, you know, it does it does feel like our role is to just pass this along, you know, and and not pontificate about it. But but I do think that uh, that we are actually required to to have a um, a recommendation on it. Yeah, I mean, I can see that you know, like for purposes of just advancing the article so that people can vote on it, it's you know, it makes sense that we would just, we would move for favorable action simply because procedurally that's the way that you get an up or down vote on, on the ward article. Um, but I'd be inclined to just say, look, you know, the, 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 um, the petition speaks for itself. Yeah, I would say I, I wouldn't have a problem um, if advisory wanted to essentially uh, at the public hearing, you know, move favorable action, but that in our sort of write up explanation um, in the packet to just explain that we're sort of moving favorable action as just a, uh, you know, a, a matter of course as a mechanism to, to, to pass uh -huh. this easily along to the um, to the voters, as opposed to saying that advisory is taking a moral stance on this particular issue. But yeah, I agree with and that. Procedurally, I think um, voting for favorable action will be easier if we say um, no action, and we have to do like a negative motion right. at the meeting. It's confusing. Right, it gets very confusing because people want to say, if I am voting, then I am voting to support this. And if I'm voting no, then I'm voting not to support it. So our our motion will just facilitate that, basically. Who's going to have their hand up, Steve? Um, oh, yes, iPad viewer has hand up. <laughs> Hi, Susan Tyler, 26 Western Ave. Um, I have a question. In all, in all the other town meetings where there have been all the citizens' petitions that have come forward, have you actually voted yay or nay on them? Because a citizen's petition with all the approved signatures automatically gets before town meeting. So I don't know yes. that you, I don't know because I know I've been involved with some in the past, mostly to get more selectmen on board, but um, I don't remember if you actually have to vote one way or the other because it's automatically heard. 
we do. We do. Yeah, we always, we always, we always make a motion as to whether we're recommending um, favorable action or no action on the petition itself. We don't right. vote as to whether it goes onto the warrant or not because it it automatically goes on the warrant. But but we do make a recommendation to the town as to whether we are voting for or you know against. Right. And and if I may make a personal comment as far as the uh, presentation that was made. I noticed that some of the photos that were shown, they're 10 years old, well before well at, uh, before the trapping was all implemented on a state level, not just on a town level. Uh, some of the photos there was clearly said that they were, they were from Idaho. This is Massachusetts, this is Sherman. And um, I'm sorry, but I don't need the town telling me what my moral judgment is as to whether I buy fur or not. And again, Sherman does not have any facility in town that has ever sold any fur products. We don't have any clothing boutiques. We don't have, all you have is the, the goodest new shop up at the Unitarian Church. And what are we gonna do? Go through there to see if any of the uh, clothing has any fur so it can't be recycled? No, no. Well, it's a valid question. It's, it, it's a valid question. And as far as a moral standpoint and the fact that we need to set, set this out, there was a citizen's petition years ago to try and get the uh, town to adopt the uh, right to farm by law. And the, and the uh, consensus was that no, the town of Sherman, of course we support it. We don't need a rule to set it in place. So thank you. Steve, if I, if I may um, make a comment. Yeah, go ahead. While probably like most, I am not particularly fond of furs or certainly not of animal cruelty. Uh, I'm also not in favor of adding laws to the town that are potentially superfluous. And as noted, there's no immediate or direct effect on any of the um, shops in town. And I'm also against nuclear weapons and uranium mining, but I don't feel like we need to necessarily put laws on the book that specifically ban those. And, um, and so my, 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 my view is that from, from an advisory standpoint in making a recommendation to the town, I guess one of the con considerations that I'm, I'm keeping in mind is that, again, I don't feel the need to add laws to the books that limit citizens' rights um, if there's not necessarily an immediate and or financial impact to the town. Steve, I am in favor of nuclear weapons. But that's beside the point. Um, I, being a citizen's petition, grassroots democracy, whether you're for it or against it, does provide the forum for people to come forward and present motions. And I, I, I believe what was mentioned here as an advisory is that we uh, decide whether we advise the um, populace, the towns, the voters, right? What we recommend is supported or not supported, um, and so whether it is banning furs or nuclear weapons, if there are fifty signatures, a hundred signatures, whatever it is, that's a grassroots effort that you know our forefathers fought and died for. Um, so. It, the process is the process. I agree. I'm not trying to stop that process, Peter. I'm saying that I don't think I don't think that we necessarily need um, laws that don't have a direct or immediate effect on the townspeople to limit their choices. I suppose, Steve, the counter example to that is that the town also did recently, with the full support of the advisory committee, vote to uh, ban uh, marijuana dispensaries in town when there are none. And there probably wouldn't have been any, but we just decided that we didn't want them. Even though, to be perfectly honest, from a moral ethical standpoint, I am much more in favor of marijuana dispensaries than either, you know, new fur products, any fur products really, or, you know, um, puppies and kittens from um, puppy mills, you know, but, but there, that's, that's a very recent precedent of this is the type of thing that the Tom um, does want to do is vote on preemptive issues that they think, I suppose, that are of a moral or ethical nature. Yes, and it's much easier to stop them before they come into town.
All right, any more questions or comments from uh, advisory for Jeanette? Yeah, just one more question. And this, let me know if this is just too, too in the weeds here, but if like, if I have, if I have a beaver problem or something and I bring on an animal control person to take those beavers, does this bylaw have any impact on their ability to do like to do the trapping subject to, I think you have to get a permit from the board of health to do the trapping, but does this limit that in any way? No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. That's a state law. Okay, perfect. And just a quick comment. I think there was mention that this does not apply to the secondhand stores, right? So like we have the swap shop in town. So there was a comment earlier that, you know, um, uh, concern about that, but I, I think this does not apply to the swap shop, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, used for, you know, swap shops, pawn shops, the antique store, maybe the antique and store, you know, one day may have it something with use for for that that is not um that is not in the definition of uh what would be in the ban the ban is just on new fur products not used okay thanks uh susie got something else uh, where do we get a copy of uh, the actual citizens petition? I haven't seen it online anywhere. So where is it where that uh, we the uh, residents can read it before town meeting? Um, I, be I believe that when the uh, when the select board actually signs the warrant um, that that it will become public because you well, it's a which will be before town meeting. Well, it's it's public if it's already been presented to you as the advisory, and if it's already presented to the uh, town clerk's office. So, is it going to be posted online so that we can read it sooner than later, or do we have to wait for it to come out in the uh, in the warrant that gets mailed out, or now it gets delivered or picked out? Susie, if I may respond, I, I would tell you I agree. It, it it is public somewhere somehow, but. Um, I don't know where one could go find that at this point in time. Maybe town clerk. Yeah, I didn't know if I mean if she has it so you can share it on your screen because I'm hearing well it's that language isn't in it. Well, I don't know what's in the language right now, so it's hard to discuss it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't think we need to debate this tonight. I mean, I think as a committee, we've all sort of said. We're going to put this to the town and let them decide. You know, it's it's really a symbolic gesture, and we can have this debate at town meeting. We don't need to debate it tonight or even at the hearing. Agreed. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you, Jeanette. Okay. Um, thank you. Now. On to Larissa Romanova uh, on the next citizen's petition, which is on the ban of sale of dogs, cats, and rabbits in pet stores. Uh, I, go ahead. Uh, so I'm a sponsor on this petition. And if you don't mind, I share my screen. Yes, go ahead. Hold on a second. So I'm a sponsor on the petition related to the sales of dogs, cats, and rabbits in the Sherman pet stores. At this point, this is a preventive measure. According to the pet shop bylaw, it will be unlawful for the Sherman pet shops to sell dogs, cats, and rabbits. These animals can be displayed for adoption only and they could be obtained from various rescue organizations. There is a definition of a pet shop, which is the concerns and questions raised by select board last time. So pet shop means a brick and mortar, mortar where dogs, cats, and rabbits are sold. 
brick and mortar uh, mortar is legal term that refers to traditional sites uh, street side business that offers products and services to its consumers such as grocery store or bank or uh, pet shop um, and there is a, another uh, consideration here exclusion um, a person who breed and sell animals on their property is not considered to be a pet shop. Uh, this definition is made to ensure that local breeders are not affected by this bylaw. Uh, what are the, uh, the relationships between private breeders and pet shops? Private breeders usually don't sell puppies to, uh, to pet shops because many breeding clubs don't even allow such transfer of puppies. On the other hand, pet shops do not buy uh, from private breeders, breeders. Like other commercial enterprises, they use an established chain of supply. And the purpose of this bylaw is to disrupt disruption pipeline used by puppy mills. Uh, what is a puppy mill? Uh, puppy mills are commercially breeding facilities. Uh, these are typical images of puppy mills. And I would like to uh, bring your attention to the size of the cages where the animals are kept for their entire life. Puppy mills are usually USDA licensed. And according to these regulations, the cages can be at least six inches larger than the dog's body. And uh, the animal is kept in this cage for the entire life, standing on the metal uh, mat. They, they are denied exercises. They are exposed to extreme temperatures in winter times and in summer. And they are bred without limits until their body is completely worn out and then killed. In 2019, the new law called PACT, it's a federal law, uh, which called Preventing, uh, Preventing Animal Cruelty and Torture Act. This law was adopted in 2019. However, these animals are excluded from this law. I can imagine if somebody keep a dog on their backyard in a cage like this for years, this would be considered as a, uh, as a federal crime, but not in this case, because this is, this are, these animals are not uh, pets, they're livestock. Currently, six municipalities in Massachusetts adopted similar bylaws, and now three states close their borders to the animals arriving from puppy mills. Uh, California, the state of California, for instance, was able to proceed with pet shop, by law, uh, pet shop law only after multiple communities expressed their will to ban sale of puppy mills animals in their pet shops. And uh, we suggest to adopt this by law as a preventive measure and also as a part of a larger effort, namely closing the pet stores of the whole state to the animals from puppy mills. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, and again, I'd like to open uh, the floor to public comment first. Susie? <laughs> Oh, you don't want to hear my thoughts. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm just wondering, we already have the town has adopted a, a general bylaw uh, section five that already deals with all the licensing of kennels, any any facility over five. So um, and I know we're, we're saying that this is to prevent the sale of puppies or and cats and rabbits in a pet shop again. 
we don't have any pet stores. There are breeder, dog breeders in town that are already governed by the general bylaws that deal with the kennels. We already have as far as rabbits, which can be sold as an agricultural commodity. And so that gets into a whole nother can of worms. Um, but we already have the animal control officer and we already have the animal inspector in town that goes out in conjunction with the fire department and the building inspector. And they already do inspections of the barns and the facilities. And the animal inspector would certainly shut any facility down if it wasn't correct. And so I don't know, again, why this one's coming up now or why it's needed. Thank you. This by law, as I already mentioned, has nothing to do with private breeders. The purpose of this bylaw is to disrupt uh, distribution pipeline, which is used by puppy mills. And these facilities are usually out of state. Thank you. All right, uh, advisory, uh, anybody from advisory have questions or comments? Um, I would say that my position on this uh, is also pretty pretty similar to the um, to the previous petition. You know, I uh, feel like our our job as advisory is basically to pass this on to the voters. Um, I am obviously personally in favor of it, but um, ultimately, as advisory chair, I am neutral and feel that it this is an issue for the the townspeople to vote on. have a question i know this came up at the select board meeting last week as well are there any there there are farms in town that sell um animals as i understand it and and i think you would say that those are private breeders but i i guess my question is are are we sure that we are not somehow inadvertently impacting the business of any existing farms in town based on the way they make those sales of those animals no, this by law will not affect private breeders and local breeders because pet shops never deal with private breeders. It's like Macy's. Technically, it may buy, uh, uh, my, buy uh, uh, clothes from uh, private tailors, but it never happened. The same, you know, there's a di uh, distribution, you know, there's a certain uh, 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 distribution chain, which is used by uh, pet shops. They buy, they acquire animals from, uh, from commercial breeding facilities, not from private breeders. There is no effect on uh, local uh, businesses. But if these farms did not breed all of the animals that they were selling, if they, if they happened to get them from somewhere else and didn't breed them on their property, would this bylaw prevent them from making that sale? I think maybe it would. No, no. This bylaw talks only about pet shops and has nothing to do uh, to uh, people who breed uh, or buy or sell animals in the town of Sherburn. It's related to only to commercial pet shops, which are located in a, a, usually in commercial district of Sherburn, of, of the towns. So does that mean a farm, you know, being a brick and mortar establishment that sells animals, if they were not actually breeding the animals um, themselves and were in fact purchasing them from somewhere else and then selling them, uh, would they then fall under this bylaw? No, no. We only talk about pet shops, which are commercial facilities and, uh, uh, I already, uh, if you if you don't mind, can I return to one of the my uh, of, of my yes. slides? Yes. Definition of pet shop. And mortar establishment where dogs, cats, and rabbits are sold. And this a brick and mortar establishment is, let me see. Um, 
It's a legal term, term which is used uh, to, uh, um, to describe some commercial facility which sells, uh, which uh, commercial facility which sells uh, uh, products to customers. Usually this commercial facility is located in this uh, uh, business district, not on the farms and not on residential properties. But as I read this definition, and we also uh, added that uh, uh, a person who sells or transfers uh, animals uh, on um, uh, their residential press preferences are excluded from this by law. But again, the, the animals would have to be bred on site, owned and then bred on site. I, as I read this, I think the scenario that Steve just mentioned where one of the farms in town does not actually breed the animals, it just obtains them and sells them. I, I think they actually would be covered under this, would be precluded by this language. I don't think so. I can, I can, you know, I can, um, if you don't, um, can I refer this question to the, uh, um, to the director of the Humane Society of the United States, uh, Mrs. Laura Hagen, uh, Huna, Huma, um, uh, Humane Society of the United States is involved, was involved in formulation of this bylaw. And she may better respond to this question, if you don't mind. I think she should be here. I am here. Laura. If you, Laura, are you here? Yes. Is it okay if I speak or? Yes, yes. go ahead, Laura. Right. Um, my name is Laura Hagan. Um, I live in Salem, Massachusetts. I'm with Humane Society of the United States. Um, so the, I, I, I think that in the hypothetical that you guys have offered, that could be a possibility. Yes, I think that um, if they are breeding and selling their own animals on their residential premises, that would be permitted. Um, so a home breeder, a traditional home breeder. Um, but if they're buying, like shipping animals in from out of state, it, that would convert them to a pet shop if they're not, they're not breeding those animals. They would also be subject to state regulations as a as a pet shop if they're shipping animals in from out of state and selling them. Do you happen to know if any of the establishments, you know, any of the farms or other establishments we have in town do that right now? I, I do not know that. I'm sorry. Uh, if it's helpful, um, the idea is, you know, that the idea is not to address uh, local breeders, right? Because as Larissa said, um, when it's the, the problems with pet shops come from the offsite breeding and shipping the animals into that facility because a person like, let's say I wanted to buy a puppy, I could not see where that animal came from, right? If I'm going to a local Sherborne farm where they have dogs and they're breeding dogs, uh, then I could see where those animals come from. I could talk to the breeders. The breeders can talk to me. You know, it's not just, a, it's, it's, a, it's more than just a financial transaction. Um, and those are where we find, you know, the successful types of breeding occur, where we have healthier animals, fewer sicknesses. We don't have the intrinsic diseases that come from animals that are being shipped across the country in volume, in bred in volume. Um, and so I, I do think in that particular circumstance, if a farmer did bring animals in from out of state, I, I do think it, in that case, it would impact them, but not if they're breeding their own animals and the on-site. And, and also just to note that this is also reflective of state law. Um, our, our state pet shop law has a similar uh, exemption to Part C. It, it's, it's almost very, it's very, very closely aligned. Um, Thank you, and oh, go ahead. sorry, just to add one more thing. Um, we do request from the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, a list of pet shops. And so um, if my interpretation is correct, that a farmer was bringing uh, dogs into the state and selling them, and that would convert them in the state's eyes to a pet shop. According to MDAR's records, there are no pet shops in Sherborne. So it's unlikely that that hypothetical is happening in practice unless the state doesn't know about it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, any more questions or comments for Larissa? Yeah, I uh, have if one. You don't mind, Larissa. Okay, go ahead, Susie. And Larissa, if you don't mind, I'm just going to stop your screen share just so I can see. Yes, yes. I don't, I'm looking how to do this myself. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Susie. Yeah, hi, me again. Um, yes. <gasps> Thank, thank her for uh, putting up that definition of the uh, what they had for pep shop because that was my, one of my questions. But um, now I lost the rest of it. Oh, God. It's been a long night. It'll come to me. Oh, citizens petition as far as whether the wording was correct or not correct and whether they should change it, going back to what, whatever organization uh, provided that uh, bylaw. On a citizens petition, once it's written and all signed and submitted, that's it. You can't change it. Because you can't change the wording if I signed it. And now the petitioner, the main lead one, went and signed it. Because no, that's not what I signed. It gets presented to the town as it was written, written and submitted to the town clerk. It can't be changed now. You know I that's true, but there are some town nuances which have to be addressed, and uh, these changes can be addressed on the floor during the town meeting. That's what we are planning to do. Yeah, if you get the vote for the amendment, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments for Larissa? All right, seeing none. Um, thank you very much, um, Thanks, Larissa. And um, we'll do this all again in a couple of weeks. Um, all right, so next we have the Sean Colleen block. Um, Sean, we can actually take these in any order that you want. These, this is basically the order that they are appearing in the warrant. So that's that's the order that I put them in. But yeah, we're gonna at least inverse them because uh, okay. the last item on your agenda, I know there's at least a couple people on here for. Sure. Um, and I, I got to vent a little. Nine fifteen, sitting through those items. Let's not do that again. I. I'll remind everyone I started the day at seven o'clock with my crew and I get to start tomorrow at seven. So I, I'm not going to entertain this again. Um, we won't make it through my whole list if there's that many questions. I'm tired. And that was painful. So the first item is Woodhaven, the last, which is going to be the first item is the Woodhaven Leland Farms. And at least a couple people were on for the capital budget um, and or the select board. Um, so I don't know if everyone on the committee has gotten the, the report. I could certainly send it to everyone. But basically going back about six months to a year, the select board authorized me to work with Whitewater, who's our vendor that does all our public water supplies, including also for Leland Farms. Um, to work on a study on whether we could combine Woodhaven and Leland Farms as one public water supply, which was also suggested by DEP. Um, they're all on town property, so they're basically all on the same piece of property. And uh, ironically, the well to Leland is behind Woodhaven. So it, it never really, it doesn't make a whole lot of logical sense that that you'd have two public water supplies on one piece of property. All you're doing is really adding costs. Um, you, you can always have as many wells as you want feeding one public water supply, but to add multiples, you're just adding complexity that, that, that doesn't make anyone safer, but it makes for more cost. So um, Whitewater, who's our trusted um, operator of the public water supply, hired a company named Onsite Engineering Company Inc. Sorry, and they did a, a a very thorough assessment of what it's going to take to satisfy DEP's requirements on treatment of the water that's both at Leland and Woodhaven. Woodhaven is right on the cuff, but Leland has had already demand letters forcing them to do something for their. It's called the Copper and Lead Rule, um, which has made a lot of headlines after the Flint, Michigan issues. When you have corrosive water, you tend to bleach or bleed copper and lead into your water from your pipes. Um, that's not a safe thing. 
Um, these are basically high risk communities and they're both um, under the town of Sherman's jurisdiction. So we had to do something. And the, the best thing to do was assess whether or not we could combine the two systems into one. Um, they did that in the assessment we have. They generalized what the costs were going to be and what it was going to take to get the permitting. The select board probably six months ago directed me to go ahead and move forward with approaching um, DEP with um, continuing on with the permitting. So that, that's what's happening right now. But part of the deal we made with, with DEP, because there was already a demand letter, you basically commit to making improvements. Uh, so we're, we're, we're committed to doing this. Um, there's some costs that were included that everyone should have in the, the capital budget committee's um, spreadsheet that basically total up to an estimate of $180,000. Um, and depending on how you try to slice that, there's a combination of Woodhaven and Leland Farms I don't want to get too deep into how we're going to pay this back at the moment, um, because by town meeting we have to make a commitment that we're going to that we're going to do it, and and probably by then we're going to have from DEP at least in writing that the permits are going to be approved and that this work needs to be done. We're, we're still we're not quite there, but we're headed in that direction, and then and then once that happens we we can't sit on it for a whole another year because the, the people at Leland are already beyond the threshold of, of having to do something and Woodhaven is right on the cuff. So we, we, we're gonna have to do this. And, and it's a pretty good estimate. This project will go out to bid. Um, I don't have that much more to say about that. Are we gonna have uh, bids before town meeting? Are we, gonna are we just going to be, are we going to have, you said the project will go out to bid. Will we have any actual bids before town meeting? So we have a precise. I don't know if number. we'll have actual bids before town meeting. I think we'll probably have in writing from DEP um, that they're going to permit it the way we expect them to permit it. There was still a lot of questions to be answered when this was written, which was back in September. Um, but that process has, has already begun. So we, we can't put it out to bid until we have 100% certainty from DEP that that's what they want us to do. Okay. John, I have a question. I, I don't under, does Woodhaven and Leland Farms both have a problem or is it just Leland Farms has a problem and it they, seems like a good idea to, to put them together? I, no, they, so they both have a problem. Um, if you were to read through the historical data that's included in the in the feasibility study, yeah, Woodhaven several years ago was was bumping just above the the thresholds, and then came back under Leland. Since then, um, was above the thresholds for copper and lead. So they Leland got the enforcement letter, but what you're dealing with is water that's very corrosive. Yeah. So it's not good. It's, yeah. it's not good to be drinking corrosive water. It's, it's not really bad water, but what it does is it causes the copper, the anode rods and all your water heaters, the, the lead that's, that's inherent in brass fixtures to leach into the water and you drink it. So, and so it's, but, but it's for both complexes, that's the same problem. That's what I'm trying it, to figure It's out. the same problem. So one's just above the threshold, one's just below the threshold. Okay, all right. By, and, and by treating it, although DEP is forcing Leland to treat it, Woodhaven's going to gain the benefits in that they have water heaters that, you know, that fail in, in three years instead of 20 um, it, it's all the same issue everyone's dealing with. It's not very good water up there at all. Um, it, it, it's not an ideal situation at all for those residents. So this is going to benefit everybody. And there's cost sharing that'll go along with it. Not, you know, there's, there's the capital, 
But when you're running two wa public water supplies right next to each other, you're doing a fair amount of testing that's just redundant. And there's no economy of scale by doing two when you could just be doing one. So the, there's some savings that'll be ongoing, you know, in perpetuity. We, we covered this extensively in the capital budget committee with um, Sean, Kitty Sturgis from um, Elder Housing and uh, capital committee. And basically it boils down, it's the right thing to do for a public water supply um, that's on leased land to two entities and we did commit to the state as Sean had mentioned, and it's really now time to bring it to the townspeople for their benefit, for the town asset of those housing communities, which contribute to our affordable housing, elderly housing stock, which gets us closer to the safe harbor, if we all remember those discussions. So it's it's, the right thing to do at the right time. There's a few more follow-up um, adjudication or um, division of financial responsibilities of which Leland Farms, uh, Woodhaven and the town are all parties mm -hmm. to. But basically this is something that's necessary for the benefit of all taxpayers. I, I um, totally agree that we need, you know, that the water needs to be fixed somehow. But I, 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 I haven't heard that that legal counsel has been consulted. And to me, it's critically important that that happen because, uh, you know, I just did enough poking around to know that there's a fairly complicated um, set of contracts and legal arrangements governing how all of those properties interrelate to one another and how that water supply is supposed to be taken care of and. I, I believe that the tenants are supposed to have responsibility for payment, um, you know, of, of, of upgrading or, you know, taking care of the water supplies. So I think it's very important. I agree. It's the right thing to do. You know, the water needs to get fixed, but I, I think we need to make sure we are approaching this very carefully, having gotten a, a, a clear legal opinion on the right way to do it, because we, I, I think we certainly don't want to get into a situation where the town is taking on or setting precedents of taking on, you know, responsibility for, for property that it is not contractually responsible for. If that were the case, I'm not saying that it is, but I, I haven't heard that we have consulted council and they have given us an opinion on the best way to approach this. And I think that's critically important. I agree. And um, I've had those discussions with uh, the town administrator today and and some prior we we discussed it briefly at the um select board meeting last last week um and we're gonna we're gonna follow up on that there's not a clear answer exactly how the funding's gonna get gonna get paid for i i want to try and keep those conversations a little bit separate um because because one's a little more complex than the other the 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 upfront costs are very clear and concise that it needs to be done and and we don't have much of a choice dep is going to demand that it be done uh, the, the the tail end of it and and what you just touched on the legal aspects are a little bit more complicated and i'm confident petrini can probably get us through that and i i i think we could, i think that can happen before town meeting it's not gonna it didn't happen before tonight I, it may not happen before the hearing, um, but we're going to work on that. It's certainly not the only thing we're working on as far as um, clarity before town meeting. I would like to strongly urge that we get a legal opinion before the advisory public hearing, because personally, I, I think it would be very difficult for me to vote on something when I really don't know, you know, w whether the town is taking on a responsibility that legally it, it shouldn't be taking on or, or you know, wh whatever the, the complications may be with that. I agree with you, it is, it is complicated and I'm not saying that we shouldn't do this, but I, I just think we need to understand what the right legal position is before we move forward. That's fine. And I think the town has, the townspeople have a right to know whether, you know, what, what the situation is before they decide whether or not they should be paying for this. 
feel free to share that with the town administrator or anyone else. I would be I'm, happy I'm to bringing this article that. forward and I'm going to and I'm going to try and bring clarity, but I'm one guy and I'm the facilities manager. So understood. Thanks. Great. Any other comments or questions about this? All right. You want to move on to your next thing, Sean? Yeah. Um, hang on. I'm working two screens. No worries. Let's jump to Pine Hill Access Road. Okay. There's not much to say. There's so the the package is coming back. I, I was trying to have it before this meeting. Um, within the next, they told me mid this week. So within the next couple of days, which will have a hard engineer's estimate. I suspect it's going to be between one three and one five. Um, for everything that's designed which is a complete redo of the parking lot, the bus loop. Well, it eliminates the bus loop at Pine Hill. Um, and it builds the road out that never got built out to Elliott Street. I'm trying to jump screen, sir. The, um, the intent before was to put that out to bid and have a hard bid back before town meeting. We probably still could do that especially since town meetings out another month. Um, so as one guy, I think that's probably the right thing to do. I don't know how much appetite there is for that. There is a, um, there is an earmark that everyone's going to keep bringing up. Um, but I, I don't know who's going to chase after that. An earmark on a bond bill is an earmark on a bond bill. It's not a check. It's not a guarantee of funding. Um, it's probably two thirds of the way through the process. So if that were to come to fruition, that's 1.3 million. Um, but that's aged over a decade because it's the same one that was written in 2007 or eight, I think. It is, can I ask real quick, is that the type of thing that our sustainability coordinator who's supposed to be spending a lot of time getting grants for the town should be chasing? Well, I think everyone that knows how to go after grants should be pitching for this, um, to be perfectly honest with you. The school should be going after grants. Public safety should be going after grants. Uh, because if the earmark falls through, we should be getting something from somebody else. Because um, I'm not even silly enough to think that the town wants to spend $1.3 million on that parking lot and road. But it can't stay the way it is. And I, neither of my counterparts on the public safety are on, but I can speak for them. It's an untenable situation right now. The traffic is backed up to roses every day for pickup and drop off. It can't stay the way it is. Um, something's going to happen. Something bad's going to happen. We're using a dirt road right now to exit the school buses. We can't keep doing that. We have to do something. Hang on, Sean. That, that's my question. As far as it can't stay the way it is. I agree the traffic flow needs to be redone there. Well, you know, I've been part of this for six years since I moved down. It's silly and I can't believe no one's had an accident up there yet, a serious accident. But as far as if it's just buses using that as an exit only, uh, you know, should it stay as a dirt road? Probably not. Uh, it's tough for me to understand, you know, and I get 1.3 million is redoing the whole parking lot, redoing all the flow, but is there not a way to somewhat simply harden the, the dirt road that's there or the, or the kind of gravel road that's there and use that just for, uh, I guess for all traffic is the goal, right? It, it, sorry, maybe let me clarify. Is the goal in the plan such that all traffic will exit out there or is that still going to be buses only? Oh no, all traffic. Remember when, uh, once we all get vaccinated, we're gonna go to all school meetings there. Uh, oh. And, we can't keep having two-way traffic on a one-way road. So forget about how we operate. It's bad enough right now. When we start going back there to, to, to meetings and people actually are allowed in the building, 
it's it it's going to be the disaster that it was before only worse um all the traffic needs to start exiting out elliot and it has to be paved it can't stay the way it is i it is unbearable to try to maintain that in the winter okay. just for the buses quick follow-up so does that mean so it's one way only exiting down to elliot street correct yeah any need for a light at elliot street no Parking on both sides of that exit? It's parking on one side. Parking, a, a sidewalk, parking on one side of coming in, but it'll be angle in. We're gonna a, we're gonna gain a ton of parking spaces, which we always needed. Anyone from the earlier generations, I'll say, remembers parking on Elliott Street for all school meetings. Um, and they remember how dangerous that was. Does this include light lights on that exit road? Some lighting, yes. And sidewalk. Light, redoing the lighting in the parking lot, which is needed, and redoing lighting go down the road. It can't be pitch dark in the woods. Yeah. All right. Susie, you have a comment or question? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I'm putting on my traffic safety hat now. I've been on traffic safety since 2004. And long before this was first brought to town meeting, Traffic Safety Committee has fully supported this. It's a dangerous situation that we've been um, fairly lucky with. There have been incidents where, you know, a tree comes down, a wire comes down. And so this access now is everybody else is stuck up at the school while they deal with whatever is impeding the driveway because right now it's one way in and the same way out. And so, no, the plan has always been to make it not an access road, but the continuation of the Supine Hill extension, one way in, one way out, and it will take a lot of pressure off of the the um, the intersection there with the uh, Elliott and North Main, and so traffic safety has been supporting this and just waiting for this to go through. And again, as Sean said, there was way back when there was a big push with the revenue, and supposedly this 1.3 million that was earmarked for us, we had to have a project shovel ready. And we got it done as quick as we could. And then things just kind of fell through. The typical Sherbin way, well, we've got it this far. It's pretty good. We'll leave it this way for a while. It's just not good. You you can't, you can't have it. You know, the continuation is supposed to have a sidewalk down the side with some lighting. So it provides additional parking for all these functions. And uh, you know, the time is time's done. It needs to be done. I think we're the only school that has one way in, one way out. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question is the, you know, what what are we voting on, right? I think we're voting on the town uh, paying for this in full, right? I mean, meanwhile, uh, feels like a select board thing to basically try to mobilize um, all the relevant troops in town to try to find money for it in any way that we can. But but meanwhile, uh, we have to be voting on what we believe to be the full amount of this project, right? You're not voting on anything tonight. Yeah, but I mean, at this town meeting, right? We're not going to have we're not going to have one point three million dollars in grant funding by town meeting, right? I have no idea. You might. I don't know. You're going to have an engineered road and it might be out to bed. That's all I can tell you. Let's move on. Okay. So the road made management, I just today finally got all the data back from the engineers. They did a second year study on all the roadways that where they send around an animated a car where they assess all the roads. Um, they sent me the data. They sent me the five-year plan. I'm not going to share it because I haven't gone through it. Um, I went through the draft, but I, I didn't go through the final before I shot it off. And if there was anything wrong, Peter Galatano would have found it in a minute. Um, <laughs> I knew that would get a reaction out of him. Um, so within the next few days, I'll shoot that off to capital budget. Uh, there's already there's a placeholder number in there um 
and all I would say is it's similar to the conversation last year. We do a very comprehensive assessment of the actual asphalt and what it's going to take to move it to a better condition, what it'll cost to keep it at the condition we're at, what it costs to lose it and then regain it. Um, you know, and then there's a percentage of work outside of just the asphalt. There's drainage, drainage work that doesn't fall under the MS4 drainage stuff, but just fixing catch basins, fixing sidewalks, fixing curbing, everything else. So we're trying to assess that number because this is basically what we're short from the state funding. We know what the state funding is historically. It hasn't moved in decades. Um, so. Uh, and this overall project is essentially a continuation of what you were you presented last year. And, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it, and it's going to be the same every year. You know, the, the, the roads change. Um, some of the priorities shift a little bit, but the essence is trying to keep it, it is our single largest asset in town. Um, it is the roads. So it's the most costly and it's the highest risk. So the, it's the basis of trying to continue a funding. Someone's listening to a game. It's um, trying to find a comfortable level that isn't zero. Um, so I remember last year you had presented that there was a certain number that was like uh, barely maintain um, the current condition or modest improvement of the current condition or significant improvement. So this, the placeholder you have right now, which is 450 grand, are, do you anticipate that that is in a sort of a moderately improve the condition of the roads kind of a level? Yeah, and, and again, what, what, um, what I don't think we highlighted really well last year, I'm gonna try and highlight it better this year once I, once I have that data and I can separate the two. It, there is two things that go into it, which is the, the pavement assessment, which we, you know, which we have a very good write up on. And then there's the other items that, that fall outside of that. Um, this particular year was a complete streets project that had been on, on the slate for, for years that finally went out to bid. We awarded the bid and we used that capital funding to, to fit the gap between the complete streets gap. And a, there was, I think, three different f uh, funding sources prior to us spending town funds on it. Um, so we knew we were going to have to fill that gap and we did. Uh, so that basically committed the rest of that money. We did a bunch of road work with it and then uh, we committed the rest of it to the project and the contingency for the project. This year we'll be less committed to that, but there's there's going to be more than just the roadway management. It's very clear what we think the roadway management will be. Um, but there's there's the other things. And then there's always the things that come up. I mean, as soon as we started doing some road work, we had a, a, a culvert completely wash out on Lake Street. So where does that funding come from? And that's, wh that's where it came from. Um, and of course, this is all in addition to the chapter 90 that we, we get every year. So that, so, you know, that's factored into the equation. So you had said that um, there is uh, a five-year plan um, sort of uh, in development or actually in draft. And so do you anticipate that as the condition of the roads improves that this number year after year is going to get smaller or do you, is this about, about what you would expect sort of year but after year in perpetuity? The goal is that the asphalt management will get smaller. And if the number doesn't get smaller, it's because we're choosing to do other projects. Um, if that makes any sense. There's discretionary projects and there's somewhat non-discretionary projects. The asphalt management, if you spend more money up front, just like your facilities and many other things, you, you, you're avoiding the big hit later. Um, 
So that, you know, that's the gist of the five-year plan on the asphalt management. But that, that's my point. There's multiple things that factor into that, that number. And unless we put them into the budget, they're into the same capital, capital line. We're not separating those things. We're, we're saying there's a certain number that we want to keep in there for asphalt management. And there's a certain percentage on top of that that goes along with it. And I'll have and that you said, better, I'll have that better defined I, for the for the hearing. For the hearing, okay, great. But it'll probably be in the same neighborhood, right? Yeah. Okay. Any questions or comments for for Sean? I, Susie, I see your hand up. Is that still just up from before, or did you have something about streets? There you go. It went down. All right. Any questions or comments from advisory about uh, roadway management? All right, great. On to your next thing, Sean. We can kind of fly through these. So um, a couple of years ago, we bought, we had ordered a one ton truck and Ford never built it. So we changed it. Um, and I asked for a small sum of money to, to just change the chassis and we we built what we call a hook lift, which is where it's not a dedicated dump truck. Um, it, it's, it's almost like a roll off, like a dumpster truck. Um, and it can be right now, currently it, it works as the truck that takes the wood chipper. It has a sander, it has a dump body. Um, so not only do we use it 12 months a year, there's, there's oftentimes we need it in, in several different functions. Um, ideally what we're looking at is building another truck, another chassis and buying a couple more bodies that'll go with it so that the two chassis can work as two trucks that can serve about six different functions. Um, we're, we're basically over utilizing that. And the, the strategy is right now we're heavy on trucks, uh, be, thanks to COVID we actually pulled back some trucks that we were getting ready to shut off because we're running one, one truck per, per employee right now. Um, because we can't have guys riding around in trucks. That's how we end up in quarantine. So once we start to, to drive the fleet back down where it's supposed to be, um, we want to get back to our plan, which that'll help us with, um, you can imagine any time during the winter that we have a bad storm when trees are coming down, we're trying to sand the roads, plow the roads, and we need to run the chipper out. So that's actually our our, our heaviest need right now. And and one truck can't do two things at the same time. And, and we have several trucks that are going to leave the fleet, um, which is going to leave us a little bit dry on uh, on smaller trucks. So we've, we've already, I've already got a quote um, to build that Ford chassis and a couple bodies to go with it. That's the 108 that you see. And then if we keep the, the way capital budget did, they, they, they put these all in one tab, even though they're two different items on the, uh, on the warrant. Uh, the next item is the Dingo. I don't know if anyone knows what that is. It's a funny name, but it's a, it's a small ride on a piece of equipment. That's like a, it's almost like a small loader, but you ride on it like a commercial mower. Um, we spent a fair amount of money this year, renting one, both to keep the ball fields in, in order and do roadside mowing and some other projects. Um, it, it has removable implements, so it's going to do a lot of tasks. And, and probably be used 12 months a year. It's also gonna help with the snow blowing um, as we increase the sidewalks that we have to do and the town campus increases when the library comes on board. And then the last item, which I don't really even think should be on the Capitol um, because I, it's a little silly to have the threshold as low as it is, but we have it, a roadside mower. 
Joe actually wrote that wrong. If anyone's looking at Joe's last sheet, that's not actually for the Toro. That's a roadside mower that goes on that large John Deere tractor we bought a couple of years ago. Um, for 17,000, as you can imagine, the uh, mowing the roadsides in Sherman is, is pretty abusive on the equipment. So we had bought one about five years ago for the smaller tractor. We used it on the larger tractor, um, but it's just about destroyed. So that's, that's one of a couple different types of mowers we use on the roadsides. You want to keep moving? Um, let's just stick with the DPW stuff um, briefly. Uh, so in total, I've got your uh, DPW equipment at 193,000. Is that still, is that accurate? Yeah, that's what it's that's, showing. Okay. Um, and Again, that's one tab, but that's two different things on the warrant. Yeah. And it needs to stay that way, I think, unless the select board does something different with the warrant and the... Um, yeah, so which, what's going to go into roadway versus non-roadway then? Well, we we did get rid of the roadways versus non-roadways thing. Okay, wait, so let me see what... It's just equipment and a truck. Um, and, oh, okay. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to ask that the dingo, if there's free cash to be spent, I would ask that that dingo be, be done in with free cash because I'm going to start leasing that piece of equipment before town meeting. Um, I need to have it within a month to get the ball fields up and running. So the lease is going to, that money will come back if we purchase it. Um, but if we, if we, if we, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference because I'm going to do it either way. Um, the lease comes out of the, budget but then it, it flushes back if, if the town meeting approves it but it, it shaves off a, about a month and a half in the uh in the leasing versus owning i because think we, that would have, have to, to wait to if it has to go to the ballot then it has to wait till july 1st to purchase so i i think then then the dingo would have to be its own item in the capital improvement plan because we will vote, um, we'll recommend at town meeting the the funding source for each item. And yeah, then I guess it would be, so the dingo and the roadside mower are together right now. So yeah, it would so be those just, two. The, the truck is not, and I wouldn't ask for the truck because the truck's a year out anyway. The truck is its own item on the warrant and, and theoretically yeah, yeah. on the ballot if it gets there. Uh, yeah. So you're right. It would be the dingo and the roadside mower because that's how they're broken out right now because those are the only two pieces of equipment outside of that truck. Yeah. Which would and be 68 and 17. The roadside mower, I don't need to spend up front. It's, yeah. it's, it's about midsummer by the time we're really using that a lot. But so the, so the dingo is the thing that you would want be purchased with free cash? I, I would prefer. I mean, it's not going to make it or break it. It just, if if there was free cash to be had, it would make sense because it makes the purchase like a month and a half earlier. Yeah. How much How much in leasing is that month and a half? It, well, it's not that much because we, we usually get 95% of it back. Um, so it, it washes back out anyway. Because um, our, our, our free cash situation might be pretty tight. So... We may be preferring um, to 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 bond as much stuff as we can. All right, then I wouldn't so lose much sleep. I wouldn't lose much sleep over it. There's been other okay. years where there where there's been hundreds of thousands, and they look and you're looking for places to go. Yeah, Heidi, you have something to say? I just want to say I think we should consider some free cash items. I don't think we have to bond everything. I think you know it's if we're looking at a difference, I think we have to really look at all the items that have to be free cash. And if we're a hundred thousand one way or the other, I don't think that's gonna make a huge difference to us in the big scheme of things. You know, if you're looking at standard and poor was one of the concerns you had, how that was gonna look. But I think we're gonna be at a point where 
we're using free cash or we're not using free cash. And that's going to be, I'd rather have our tax rate and some of that issues be the drivers right now. Um, so keep it in your back pocket for a conversation later. If it comes up again yes. and you guys are thinking about where would we put a little bit of free cash? Yes. If you were to ask okay. me, I can already tell you that's where it would be. If not, yeah. yep. that's okay. In any case, though, I mean, Heidi, I think ultimately, I think what it means is that because for the purposes of this ballot, which is due on April 6th, I think we're going to try to assume that every single thing is going to be borrowed because that gives us the optionality, right? It'll, it'll give us the option to convert it to free cash later, but you can't go the other way, right? We can't decide yes. now to be free cash. And so, Cor so, correct. so that means every single thing that might go to free cash now also would need to be a separate ballot item. Not, right, not just right. a and, warrant. And, right, and but the ballot items tend to be grouped like together, such as DPW equipment. We're not listing out every single item usually on a ballot question, and there's no dollar total. Okay. So we can talk about. It doesn't have to be tonight, but we can talk about that. But okay. there's ways. To so we could it. still break those out later. I I think there's we have to look and come up with a couple because I know. Usually Paul Dorensis only wants the least amount of ballot questions possible. So usually we've had a DPW equipment and then a DPW road management, you know, road yeah. or storm management question. Yeah. But we actually haven't really Steve, you would be able to do that. We've done that before. If, well, you, if, you the, if everyone decides to make one ballot question for all of DPW equipment, yeah. Your motion, I I'm pretty sure your motion could be that the dingo be paid with free cash. Right. The, the others move forward and the ballot question only applies to the things that were that were bonded. Bonded, yeah. Um, and it just wouldn't apply. Again, you know, as I'm saying all this, because of town meeting being late and and um, the election being late, it, it makes less of an impact. On a normal year, it's, it's, it's a couple months difference. Um, I don't even remember when the election is. Uh, the ballot is, I think, June 6th, 15th. Oh, so we're talking two weeks. Right. <laughs> it's normally not two weeks. It, yeah. So it, it, all right, it doesn't really matter. Okay. I didn't have that calendar in my head. I mean, it, it makes a little difference, but to, to June 15th to July 1st really makes no difference at all. I'm sorry. That's right. Uh, but still, I just, I just want to make sure we maximize our, our optionality in terms of how, how we're going to fund each, each thing. So, um, all right. Any, any other questions from advisory about the DPW equipment? All right. Nothing. All right, so now moving on to your next thing. Is it just the facilities replacement fund? So Peter did an unbelievable job of uh, taking our newest, we had on-site insight come in and do an assessment of all the buildings again. Uh, and they sent us the reports. Peter then took them, processed them, put them into a data table, um, which actually did a really nice job of splitting some of the items. Whoa, sorry. I just screwed my screen up. Um, between capital and operating budget, probably further than I ever would have. Um, what I'm going to do in the next week or so is try to decipher some of that into some, some major projects. Um, last time we talked about the operating budget was, and Stephen, you, you made this point as I didn't really put much that we had discussed over the years that shouldn't have been in capital into the operating budget. Um, the follow-up is we should do that. Um, and still obviously fund the, the capital. 
the article, the, the reason for the article is we're trying to set up a different um, mechanism, more like a revolving fund. We've been going back and forth with Petrini because um, the verbiage on site uses is more of a commercial term with the replacement reserve capital. That's what we used, but that's not a municipal fund. Um, they kind of work towards a stabilization fund, but as you guys know, a stabilization fund causes another town meeting vote to take money out of the stabilization fund. So that's not really the intent. The intent is a revolving, something like a revolving fund where we don't, we don't change the oversight of the spending, but we, what we, what we try to avoid is the multiple town meeting warrant articles that are open at the same time and, and somewhat overlapping and then the finance department, the treasurer are forever trying to close trailing articles um, and, and net them down to zero and carry another one forward because the projects don't land on fiscal years. The plan doesn't land on fiscal years. Only the town meeting articles do. Um, so if we, if we successfully create the reserve or the replacement, whatever capital fund we create, it'll just stay open and we'll fund it with a certain number um, any given year, then we'll spend whatever we spend out of it and we'll review it um, through capital budget and we'll review the projects, but we won't be closing something out each time. We should just be closing projects out, not town meeting articles because they don't necessarily coincide to a certain list of projects. Does that make any sense? What would be the scope of what would be included? Would, for example, improvements to Pine Hill, would those be part of, in scope? Uh, no, I, the intent was not to change the scope from what we're doing now. Um, Pine Hill has its own. It, it would only be the town facilities that we've been doing um, under the facilities. So would the last, so, so what would that like, be? What would it, yeah. So, so it's town hall, uh, the fire department, police department, DPW building, and would the library would fall into it also? Currently the library doesn't. Um, and I don't know if it would because you have the legal aspects of the trustees, mm -hmm. et cetera. So, so right now it, to answer Jane's question, it does not, it's, it, it's not intended to change any of that. Uh, it's to be exactly what we're doing with the exact same projects, the same outlook, just a different, uh, a different article, so to speak. And then the input into this fund, it would still be essentially the same process as it is now. Like there would be, would there, there would be, you would go through capital budget, uh, you would get your bids and but then to actually approve it, it still goes to town meeting with individual projects listed out, but then ultimately it's just that the cost of this project would be put into this fund. Is that how it would work? Yes. It, okay. It, the, the, almost like the front end won't change. The authorities won't change. You ju we just won't be closing out an annual town meeting 19 or an annual town meeting 20 and an annual town meeting 21 uh, article. Um, it'll just be reconciling what's in there versus what was spent. Um, and, and, but the capital, the the this process won't change. the The capital improvement plan will still apply and justify the funding into it. And each year we'll still have to go to town meeting and ask for something to be funded into it which is why there's two different articles on the warrant. There's the creation of it and then the funding of it. And so the justification this year of the funding of it is, is identical as if it was um, down in the, in the um, capital improvement line items. But I, I'm still a little unclear, Sean. Are you saying that there would be a fund and each year the town would vote as to how much to put into that fund? And then rather than voting, you know, 100,000 for this and 200,000 for that, there would just be one sum that would be voted on to be put into the fund. And then that money would be spent to for capital improvements to town facilities. Is that how it would work? That is how it works. 
we only do one one sum into the capital improvement plan for the town buildings right now and we'll continue to do that and capital budget reviews what what you know generally what's on that plan but those aren't hard fast numbers they never were some of those but some of those plans go out projects go out to bid. So the number that's that's in the plan from a couple of years ago isn't exactly what's going to be on a public bid. So that process won't change. It's one, it's one number right now. Last year we put in whatever we put in. And it's and it's loosely tailed to that. But as we as we spend the funds, we close out one town meeting article, then it rolls into the next one. Well I, I Okay, so right now I'm looking at something that says uh, there's a request for 430,000 for town buildings for this year. So, as an example, would you be would you say that we you know we'd have this fund and then there would be a vote by the town to put 430,000 dollars into this fund? Yes. Okay, so then the difference would be what I, I'm not clear on what's different. Oh, the difference is that town meeting article that that fund won't draw down to a that fund will just exist um so the finance department anyone in the finance department can answer to this there if the fund just exists at, as the revolving funds do and some of the other funds they don't have to try to draw it down to zero and then and then move on to another one right now when they have a town meeting article say there's a atm 18 in ATM 19, and there's $13,000 left in a annual town meeting 18, they're trying to get an invoice to, to hit that, to close it so they can reconcile. And then the next invoice is gonna hit annual town meeting 19 and then 20. And, and they're constantly a couple of years in the rear trying to clean up this mess. Um, I'm sorry, I'm confused because this is capital, right? We're not talking about the operating budget, right? I'm We're not, talking about capital. So it doesn't have to close out in any given year, right? No, it doesn't. It's not even close to any given year. I'm, I'm saying as of a year ago, we probably had three of them open. Right. So I, I don't understand what the problem is. I mean, we, we have a mechanism for dealing with this now, right? I mean, we, we approve these and we approve whatever we're approving for town buildings, let's say, and then improvements are made and that amount is drawn down on and either it gets spent or it doesn't, but it doesn't have to get spent within the fiscal year, right? What so, part of having three annual town meetings for the same purpose isn't confusing to you? Because it is to the finance department, I can assure you. No, no. We overspend one, then we underspend the other one, then we're trying to clean it up. It's a mess. It's a uh, complete mess. Can, can, I, Deb, can, I, can I interrupt? It, it really yes, is a mess. It, it's really, the accounting hasn't really, um, it's not impacted, Jane, I'm kind of going with what you're saying here is we just need to pay more attention to where the expenses are coded. And as we draw them down, it hasn't been paid attention to much recently. So what Sean's referring to is there was some negative spending and some um, excess spending and stuff like that. And we can, in the accounting world, we can just move that money around and zero those accounts out and going forward, just zero out the the uh, the latest um, ATM and then just zero that out and then move to the next one. So it's and for accounting, it, it has no difference whatsoever. So that I, I'm sorry, I just don't understand what we're trying to accomplish here. You don't? I don't. I mean, so every, as, every as year I we have a list of 12 projects, 16 projects, 20 projects, and we have to, we painstakingly go through them and it never lines up the way we want it to line up by fiscal year. But it doesn't have to, this is capital, right? So I, understand. I think the distinction, my con I'll tell you what my concern is, and you can tell me whether my concern is found, well-founded or not. My concern is that right now, the citizens do have the right to vote on whether they think we should be paying for all the things on those line items, right? Yep. And and I think that perhaps what, what, what we would be moving to is a situation where 
that doesn't happen. No. Nope. Citizens would be asked for some money and then it would just get spent, however it gets spent. No, it's not the case. I, okay. Well, then what is the difference? There's no difference. There's no difference in what the citizens are asking for. You, 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 you keep going back to that and I'm not gonna entertain that. Capital budget is still gonna review the same exact process. It doesn't change that. It changes the fact that there's some years we're gonna fund a lot more, there's some years we're gonna fund a lot less, but the capital plan moving forward has that all laid out. So instead of sitting here and painstakingly to go through exactly which month I'm gonna, because frankly, I don't work on fiscal years. You guys do and town meeting does, but most construction projects, most building projects do not. We don't for capital it's a, though. It's a terrible- capital is no, not tied you, to a fiscal year. You do because you asked me to start talking about it in January and then I got to figure it out in July, but I can't start it before July because the fiscal year hasn't started. So this just needs, it, the, the point is to just become a rolling capital so that there's some momentum to just get projects done instead of start, stop, figure out what you need to do. Tell me a year ahead of time what you need to do and put it out to bid before we get there. It just, it doesn't work. In reality, it doesn't work. The taxpayers will still get the same exact thing they've been getting. Look back at exactly what we've done the past three or four years, five years. That's exactly what we're still gonna do. But the fund is just gonna be rolling through year after year after year. You're still gonna choose what you wanna fund it with. You're still gonna have the same amount of transparency with capital budget, the same spreadsheet, except thanks to Peter, it's much more clear because he had some time to sit down and much more skill than I have. And it'll still be all out in front of you. If, if you think we've taken anything from the taxpayers, you're looking at it wrong. N none of that's changed. Sure, I think what we were missing was the projects from year to year being completed. And, and I, I get your point of uh, the timing of things and the contract is being ready during the warm months, but you have to plan during the winter. Um, but to J Jane's point is that, that capital is kind of permanent and you're, you're always gonna have that fund, even if it takes you three years to paint the side of a building. And so what if operating funds are going into that revolving fund, that's a little different because then you have a, a longer life to those operating funds. But capital is something on the books that is tied to what's certified at the town meeting and then the invoices, whenever they come in, go against that vote for that particular capital item. Well, so, so there's that's the problem with advisory forcing us to do a, operating with capital. Because it, well, it, that's what we've been doing. That's We're trying to correct that by, and again, with the new, the latest brand new uh, on-site insight, we split out capital from, from uh, operations by definition of operations and by project. So now we can align exactly what's under $10,000 or fifth, whatever the, the limit is um, and, and three years of life and line them up by specifically what the school system does is they take the on-site insight and they give us the exact item. They have less items to do, but they adhere pretty religiously to that. I think we're moving towards that. And yes, you may need a slush fund for the operating because of the fiscal years, but capital should be pretty adherent to at least the latest on-site insight report. And, and as proposed now, there's a, a significant gap between what Onsite Insight has for the first year in terms of capital expenditure and the 433. It's about 166,000 difference. And it's just a matter of reconciling what's in the assumed budget for capital and what's on the report. So it's interesting you brought the schools up. 
You know where I'm going with this, right, Peter? What did the school bring to the capital budget last week? Nothing. If we're going to use that as a comparison, nothing. But what are they going to spend on capital projects on the region? $355,000 they brought and said, we're not bringing that to your town meeting. Why? Because it's E&D expenses. So you guys are okay. Sean, you guys actually, they gave us that meeting? option and we asked them to pay for it with E&D, just, just to be clear. Okay. So the taxpayers asked, they were asked what? What were the taxpayers asked for? Just to be clear. Because I spent $30,000 fixing sprinkler system at the, at the town hall while the building was vacant. And you, you just told the region to spend $355,000 on capital that hasn't been vetted by the capital budget, hasn't been vetted by the town, hasn't gone to town meeting. And you're gonna to preach to me about what I'm spending on fixing you know, the door threshold at the town hall. First of all, the region is a completely different situation because we are in it with Dover, right? So I, that's I'm, I'm there, completely there, aware there of the region situation. There are a lot of other factors there, but but be that as it may, I'm just trying to understand what is to be gained by this, and I I, I just don't I just don't see it. I, I get expect, Sean. I really if I can ask you, you to. Sean, if can I can ask you a up? question. Yeah, I got about um, five minutes. I gotta go. If uh, if you were if you were to have 100% of your necessary operating budget in operating and capital was only in capital, would yeah. that make this fund you're proposing unnecessary? No. But it would, it would, it would obviously diminish the ask. But you're not going to give me 100% of what needs to be in operating. Yeah, but I'm just saying theoretically, right? But I'm going to resubmit the budget with a significant hit. Yeah, but still, my point is that if 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 all of the capital um, approval is tied to specific capital projects, does that make this, you know, having multiple fiscal year things open at the same time problem basically not a problem? No, it's still a much better process. You can tie it to, to to projects if you want. It's a much it's a better process. I can assure you. But if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. It's it's ten twenty. Let's move off of that fund. Is there any other questions for me? Yes, I I have about two hundred and fifteen thousand in additional funds from both capital and operating that vary from the on-site insight. And so either you're pulling projects from later years into the current year, or there's something that Onsite Insight hasn't reviewed or hasn't looked at or wasn't aware of. And, and that's just a reconciliation. And, and I know you didn't have the report. The, no, the, I, yeah, I threw that number out there before I had the reports right. or before we, we quantified it. Right. That's right. not the number we're going with. I, again, I haven't. I'm just just reconciling, you know, the experts that we invested and in, in gone with for 10 years and your assessment and showing that there's a delta, a favorable delta, if we bring it back to uh, the on site insight report. And, and even if you have some uh, emergent, urgent funds in there. You know, there's still some room for savings, is, is my comment from comparing the on site insight report and the journey we've traveled so far in operating in capital for buildings. Right. But operating in capital in your sheets, 500,000. The on site insight, yes. Yeah. So I wasn't that far off to begin with because most of that 500,000 is not in the operating budget right now. I had 315 for operating and 440 for, and maybe I'm, I pulled the 433 for capital. Right, but I, I don't have all of that in the operating budget. That's the thing. I have to adjust the operating budget yeah, to make yes, up for that. Yes, and, and again, there's still work to be done because right. the, the, the new numbers. Right. Uh, but you, you were conservative and 
I, I'm hoping that you can bring that more into line with what the on-site insight survey says. And if you need that revolving fund for operating funds because of the fiscal year, that seems to make sense. Because projects Wait. could pass over a July, uh, June 30th, and you don't want to just stop a project or especially if there were serial projects, uh, paving and then sidewalks and then ramps, that could take, you know, more than a fiscal year. But isn't yeah, the way you... that's handled now that, you know, there might be a turn back if it didn't all get spent in one year, but then it goes into the next year's budget and the budget gets reviewed every year and it gets voted on every year. I mean, we already have a mechanism to deal with that, don't we? Well, there's no turn back on the facilities capital. No, it was, no I'm it talking was, about the operating. I see your point, Jane. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking of, of the transactional perspective. If they have the cement truck there on June 30th with, you know, $5,000 worth of cement, you don't want to say come back next week because we have to do another transaction. I can see where it would make it easier across fiscal years um, if there were multiple projects in operating. But it would also mean, and I'm not aware that we do this for any other department, we don't do this for any other department, it, it, that, you know, that there'd be a separate, there'd be like a special little separate operating fund in addition to the operating fund that gets voted on every year by the citizens as part of the budget. I, I don't know, I don't know why we would do that. No, we don't. But it's part of the on-site insight suggestion. So our subject matter expert came with the report that says this is the best practice. Uh, and and it, I'll have to go back, but could be for both capital and operating, but to have a fund like this. So it, there was a precedent from a subject matter expert of on-site insight that came up with this idea. Well, are you talking though about a capital stabilization type fund? Because that I totally understand and would totally support. And I would actually suggest that it be broader than just for town facilities and that it be, you know, more broadly for capital across the town. If that's what Onsite Insight is suggesting, yeah, I mean, I get that. But this sounds like something different from that. No, that's, that's, that's what it was called. But the, when, when once the legal counsel phrased it as that, it actually overcomplicated it because what it would do if in, in municipal funds, if you call it a stabilization fund, it's going to push you out a year before you can spend it because you need a town meeting vote to pull anything out of a stabilization fund. So if we went to go to town meeting in 21 and put $400,000 in, we'd either need to turn around and ask for the money, the authority to spend it, or we'd have to wait till 2022 to spend it. And that's not the intent of that at all but if if the intent is to keep a consistent volume of money going into it to offset those high peak years like when you need a huge boiler or a roof or something something else that's the intent of it not that you're going to spend it down every year but you're going to level out the funding so that each year you you get used to all right we're going to spend three hundred fifty thousand dollars each year and it just so happens that you only have two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of projects this year, but the, the hundred's going to carry over to next year because you have an extra three hundred thousand dollars next year in the in the in the um, plan. That's what it was. But when we called it a stabilization fund, it didn't really work because you you didn't have the authority to spend it because they're capital and they need to get voted on by the town. Is that why? Well, no, because sta any stabilization fund. And you guys use them all the time. You put money into them every year. You need a town meeting vote specifically to pull money out of that stabilization fund. Right. So you'd be, if you were trying to fund this year's projects, you'd be putting money into a stabilization fund. Then you'd turn around and get a, get back up on stage and say, well, now we want to spend the money we just put in the stabilization fund. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. 
Um, again, that's why I'm saying the wording's not 100%. It's not a, it's, it's not a specific revolving fund the way we're used to it, um, where we tell people spend that down. Um, and there is no. Do you risk. know, Sean, the, this type of fund that you are proposing or town council is working on, does anything similar exist in another municipality in, in Massachusetts? That's, that's what we're trying to find. We 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 took what on-site insight very well explained, and 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 Peter hit on it, and and tried to peg it, and it wasn't exactly that. The problem is, again, we're. We're in a unique situation where we fund our operating with capital. So, I mean, if you look at the yeah, list, you think, you think we go to town meeting to talk about the 48 things I spend capital on, you're kidding yourself. I, we don't, but we do it. And that's not my yeah. fault. That's, that's the town's unwillingness to, to, to budget properly. So if we, wanna, if we wanna start the conversation over, let's start over with the operating budget and put it where it should be. And then we can dwindle the capital down to four or five projects a year, but that's not where it's been. Yeah, but that's that's why I was asking you if you had all the operating that you needed in operating and only capital was in capital, would that make this fund unnecessary? You know, because because if it did, then it'd be like, okay, well, we're obviously not going to do that whole shift in one year, and we would have to consider doing something to to bridge that that gap as we as we corrected um how things are 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 paid for but um you know i'm uh, you know it's just like jane i'm trying to get a sense of what is the problem that this fund is being proposed to fix you know and is there a different way to fix it you know and the fact that we're not sure if any other town does this also makes me concerned whether this is a good way of doing things <laughs> you know you never want to be the only town that's handling municipal finance in a particular way. And so it's like, all right, well, it seems like we need to correct something here, right? Um, well, we got a lot of stuff may... to correct. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. And, and, and at 1030 at night, it's frankly not the time to fix it. I'm sorry. But we, right. we're talking about the same thing we've been talking about for five years, six years. I mean, if you guys don't want to fix it, then you rebuild the operating budget the way you want. I, I mean, I, to, for me to get on at 10 o'clock at night and get kicked nine against one and try to figure out the operating capital budget, I, whatever. Keep it as a town meeting article. Call to the, the, the selectmen are going to have to change the warrant and everything else. But you got to fund the capital and you got to fund the operating. You choose what you want to do. It's, it's really hard to go through this process every year. Capital budget doesn't know which way to turn. They pushed you to put it into the operating budget. We haven't done that yet. You asked me to do it. I'm going to put a blanket number in there in the operating budget to cover the gap. It, it doesn't fit into line items the way that it's set up in, in the budget because they've never been there. So you're going, to, you're going to look at the historic values and you're going to say, Sean, you're out of your mind. But that's where it's been. So if you want, I'll change it. Sean, here, I'll, this is what I can do for you. You still need a couple hundred thousand dollars to capital this year, whether you like it or not. Sean, and and before you go to bed, if you don't go to bed before this meeting ends, I'll send you um, capital detailed totaling $233,522. You have the same number. An operating budget line for 265000 894 and as you know by building by project by system and that's at least uh, a data driven start that you can enhance whittle down expand um, that ties back to the subject matter experts of on-site insight And, 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 an and when I bring back the operating budget, Peter, you're going to tell the rest of the committee that it's okay that I ran the town operating budget for the buildings up two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Well, you 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 had it at three fifteen the last time we met. Right. So it was a fifty thousand dollars savings. Now you you may justify those fifty thousand. Well, I know there's some. Uh, no, it's not a savings. That's 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 in addition to. I didn't cover any of those expenses. So you want me to add what, 80, 70, 80%? Yeah, 
And we're going to call that level. We'll call that level funding. I'll take that deal. So everything in your operating budget was above what, and beyond what on-site insight came was up not, with? Was not inclusive of those things. Really? So yeah. they, they weren't aware of those needs in those buildings? No, you haven't allowed me to fund those things in the operating budget. So we've been paying for electricity, inspections, some of the repairs. I mean, I'd have to go line by line, but I'm, I'm going to tell you that probably 70, 80% of the operating things that are in on-site insight are not in the operating budget right now. They consider those operating, but we did not. Operating, but we did not. We never have. And where did we put them? In the operating budget? We've been, we've been capitalizing them for the past decade. Okay, so they were funded. They're in the annual town meeting articles that I've been trying to clean up. Peter, am I understanding you correctly that Onsite Insight has suggested what they think the appropriate amount is for operating for town facilities and for capital for town facilities? They've, they've done both. What we did is we, we took the definition of capital and everything that was below capital was operating. And so by project, by building, by subsystem um, for the next 20 years, we have those inflated dollars all laid out. Okay, yes. but, but on-site insight wasn't including and in operating things like, you know, buying the cleaning equipment and the electricity and that, it, or, or, or were they? Well, they were not. No, the, the small things were the sign, the $2,000 sign out in front of the building. That, that was an operating okay. item. Okay, so it was basically stuff that we might have in the past thought of as capital, but they're saying, no, you, this here's how you should split it up between operating and capital. Is that right? No, they, they didn't use the definition between capital and operating. We just applied the capital budgeting definition of capital and then everything else by default was operating. So the wind is to understand better what the delta is between what Sean has is an op has in his operating budget and what onsite insight says should be in the operating budget. It's about 50 grand where Sean has 50,000 more. Yeah, but but Peter, Sean is saying that none of those things are in the onsite insight report. So okay. that, that, would be, that that would be my question is what what do you have $300,000 worth of that onsite insight was like we're not actually going to even put that in the report. Like what kind of stuff is that? And again, this may be the first time we're going down to this granular level of detail because we have it, but it it does reconcile better going forward. But I mean, Peter, are you suggesting that there is nothing outside of the onsite insight report that should be necessary for maintaining a town building? I'm I'm only working from within the onsite insight report and rely on Sean to tell me how it is. I mean, is that I was able to, to, to aggregate the data in a certain way from that report by year, by building, by project, so yeah. that we can but track I think this is the Peter, I think this is the message that's being lost between what you're saying and what Sean is saying. You are suggesting that on site insight is saying it costs two hundred and sixty thousand dollars to run these buildings. And Sean is saying no, it costs Five hundred and eighty thousand dollars to run these buildings. That's a pretty big difference. Let right. me let me explain the difference between the two, in really simple terms. On-site insight looked like looked at what it was going to cost to change the toilets in the buildings. The budget cleans the toilets in the buildings. You've been capitalizing changing the toilets in the buildings, and on-site insight is saying no, you shouldn't do that. You should, the operating budget should, should cover changing it and cleaning it. They didn't consider the electric bills. They didn't consider the inspections. They didn't consider the small repairs to the alarm systems. They didn't consider any of the cleaning expenses, any of that. That has nothing to do with on-site insight. They did consider 
the painting of the and outside, those things, the fixing of the trim, all the things under $10,000, which is a lot of things. So when we stack everything that's not in the budget now with the operating, you're going to wish we didn't do that. But I'm more than happy to do that. But it's, it's going to add several hundred thousand dollars to the operating budget of the buildings. So what night would you like me to bring that? And it'll be seven o'clock, not 10. I suggest we have to do something with it. Yeah, we, we've been talking about it for years. Yeah. Well, I mean, to be honest, Sean, I, I was expecting that that's what your town building's budget was going to look like when you submitted it this year. And then instead of having this particular debate at 1038, uh, you know, a, a month before the public hearing that we would have been discussing this the very first time that we spoke with you, you know, I, I personally, I think it's too late to do that for this budget cycle, but I think this is what we need to do next year. Right. And and maybe we don't shift it a hundred percent, but but we need to figure out how how to make this happen, right? That's fine. And then in the meantime, the question is, do you really need this um, this uh, this capital fund that you're proposing? If 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 we were to commit over the next couple of years to really sort out your budget so that operating is operating and capital is capital, do you still need this? You know, that's that's why I'm cycling back to okay. It, it makes uh, well, sense. Out, it, today. it makes sense outside of that, and I, and I, okay. you know, I'm not going to articulate that that well. Yeah. At, at now 10:40 at night, there was a pretty good presentation for it. There's a pretty good justification for it in the on-site insight report. I beg you to read it. Um, and, and I, I got to remind you, you guys start the year with preaching to every budget maker to level fund. So if you don't want me to level fund, why don't you take the time? to ask me to not level fund. I level funded this budget. I get kicked in the teeth every time I bring the operating budget. So I brought the operating budget. It wasn't my top priority on New Year's Day. I was trying to get through what I had to get through with the with the DPW and everything else. I brought through what, I, what, what wasn't gonna get me raked over the coals right away. If you wanna change the operating budget for the town buildings, feel free to do it. But don't ask me to level fund and then ask me why I didn't add a couple th hundred thousand dollars to it. It wouldn't have gone all that well in January. If you want to change it, change it. If you don't, don't. But we're going to go to town meeting and ask for some capital to cover it like we have every other year. I'm sorry to be honest with you, but it, it, it's really difficult when we start the year with with, with your advice to the, to the budget makers, because I followed your advice. That's a fair point. All right. Susie, did you have something? Yeah, I just, oops. Yeah, I just like to say that in the past, citizens' petitions, when they come to all of these meetings, they're at the end so that the town employees and the department heads can get their stuff done first. And I, you know, I'm sitting here feeling really bad for Sean or anybody that still has to get back to work tomorrow morning. And again, citizens up petitions up are important. I've been involved with them, signing them, getting signatures. I'm full aware of the work that goes into them, but they were always taken at the ends of the meetings. Thank you. Thank you. All right, does anybody from advisory have anything more? Sean, can you come back on March 24th to talk about this more? Not at 10 at night. Okay. What if I put you first? Fine. Okay. I'll resubmit what I got. I'll be... March... Tw That's two weeks? I'll see capital budget okay. before then anyway. I okay. think. Tomorrow. Huh? I, I think it's the 11th. Oh, that should be fun. I'll see you tomorrow. All right. Yes. All right. I think we're done with Sean. Thanks. Uh, all right. Um, as painful as this is, I do want to try to get through uh, 
no, let's push the meeting minutes off to the next meeting. Um, all right, can I get a motion to adjourn? Yes, motion to adjourn. Second. All right, oh. everybody wave your hands. Yeah. All right. 1042.